I'd like to call this regular council meeting to order. Before we proceed, I want to acknowledge that the land upon which we are located is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe people, um, many of whom continue to reside in our community along with other uh, indigenous peoples and add to the richness of life in our community. Uh, would you all please rise for the invocation? We meet to serve our community and endeavor to be worthy custodians of all that has been entrusted to us. Let us be concerned only for what will promote good government. May we bring to our council chamber minds that think and hearts that feel, so that in our deliberations we may display imagination, wisdom, and courage, and the will to do our work for the good of all. Thank you. Madam Clerk, the roll call. All members of council are present, your worship. Thank you. There is one addendum, uh, and actually the addendum needs to be amended because the uh, additional delegation, Jeffrey Aldridge, has, um, uh, has um, changed uh, his mind, so he won't be coming out tonight. So that will be deleted from, from our addendum and the agenda. I can also say that when we get to presentations and delegations, uh, Delegation B, uh, Anthony Bovell, is also going to be rescheduled. He's requested that uh, he be removed from tonight's agenda. Uh, there's just one announcement that I want to make, and that is that on Friday, this Friday at 6 p.m. at the Crystal Ridge uh, or West End Arena, there is a Fortery International Academy uh, Every Child Matters charity hockey game, and uh, everyone is encouraged to go out. Excellent hockey, excellent um, charitable um, cause, and um, last year it was very well attended, and so this year um, I know that Councillor McDermott will be there for sure. Um, and I'll be there as well. We'll, well. We're either going to be dropping the puck or he'll be throwing it at me. I'm not sure, <laughs> not sure which, but I'm hoping drop. Um, okay, are there any um, declarations of pecuniary interest? Councillor Flagg. Thank you, Your Worship. In the bylaw package 4-3-2023 to amend the bylaw one twenty nine ninety as amended. Also 49-2023 to repeal the deeming bylaw number 131-2000 on Rebstock Road. In addition, 5-0-2023 to exempt certain lots in plan 59M through 65 from part lot control. Um, my son works for Mars Homes and uh, they're all involved in these bylaws. Okay, any others? Madam Clerk, I have, I'm gonna declare a pecuniary interest with respect to item two under new business of CAO 07-LC04-2023, which is the land committee minutes. Uh, that's because uh, that item r deals with a property that is owned by my former law partner. So when we come to that, I'm going to ask that that be dealt with separately from the balance of the land committee minutes. And uh, if Councilor McDermott is still the uh, acting mayor, then I'm going to ask him to take the chair for that particular item. Uh, if there are no other declarations of pecuniary interest, then we've got some upcoming public meetings. On April the 3rd, we have a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and they all start at uh, 6 o'clock here in the council chambers. The first one deals with Frenchman's Creek Drain. Uh, the information report for that will be available on our website on Wednesday, March the 29th, 2023, uh, after 5 o'clock. There's also a building permit fee um, public meeting uh, under the building code, and that, uh, again, 6 o'clock, April the 3rd. Uh, same day, same time, here in the council chambers is a proposed zoning bylaw amendment with respect to 3624 Hazel Street. The information report on that particular application will be available on our website Wednesday, March 29th, 2023, after 5 p.m., and the same applies to a proposed official plan and zoning bylaw amendment for 3011 Point Avenue Road North. Um, that takes us to the Regional Council report. Good evening, Councillor Encina. Good evening, Mayor Redekop, Councillors, staff, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The funding for the Homelessness Prevention Plan has been provided to the region for the 2022, or sorry, 2023-24 year. Um, the amount ha that has been provided is, has this, is the same uh, as last year, and there was no um, reflection of any in, in 
excuse me, inflation costs. Currently, the region contributes 1.7 million of the levy fund and also another 2.3 million in levy funding for bridge housing and permanent supportive housing facilities. This coming from the Social Services Capital Fund. The Niagara region is one of the highest in comparisons to other regions in contributions towards homelessness uh, from the levy. Programs that are associated to this are effect, that are affected are community outreach and support services, housing assistance, supportive housing, and emergency shelter solutions. Um, currently, social services is now uh, becoming overburdened by the increase of the asylum seekers that are now being placed in hotels, motels in Niagara Falls. As Council is aware, the federal government has now uh, sent approximately 2,500 people to the Falls area, causing a strain on all the systems that are in place. The report of the Niagara Poverty Reduction Strategy in Niagara Region showed that there are 14.5% of residents in the region currently living below the poverty line. Statistically speaking, if a person makes below an annual salary of 22170 or a single parent with one child making under $31,300 or a couple with two children, two children making below 44000 then they are below the poverty line. With the increase in, in the inflation rate and increases in groceries and services, it doesn't take long for those on assistance to fall behind, especially since social assistance funding remains, has remained stagnant. The Niagara Region Emergency Management has received a grant for their proposal of the Weather Aware and Prepared Initiative. Uh, the initiative is a partnership with the, re with the region, the Canadian Meteorological Oceanographic Society, I didn't say that right, sorry about that, Society, um, the Niagara Safety Village, and the Niagara Region. This will allow for the development of a weather education program for children, teaching them how and what to do during severe weather conditions. This will come in handy, I believe, for a lot of the residents here in Fort Erie after what we've gone through. The program will be delivered uh, at the Niagara Safety Village on the grounds of Niagara College. Uh, further information will be, will, be bring, will be brought forward. The Emergency Management Unit with the Niagara, along with the Niagara Emergency Medical Services gave a presentation at the region regarding the up and coming total solar eclipse. It appears that one of the rarest and spectacular phenomena will be coming to the Niagara area on April 8, 2024. Niagara is one of the few places in Canada where one can observe the point in time when the moon will completely cover the sun, resulting in the shadow. This was brought to our attention as works are currently underway to plan for this event. The last time one happened in 2017 that went through the United States, it drew an influx of over 1.7 million viewers to the area to watch the total eclipse. The next one for the Niagara area will be 2144, so you might want to mark your calendar for April 8th, 2024, unless you're George. Thank you, Mayor. Did you say you were planning on being there in 2144? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are there any? Thank you very much, Councillor uh, Incina. Any members of Council have any questions of Regional Councillor Incina? <coughs> I guess it was very clear and concise. Thank you very much. Uh, that takes us before we go to presentations and delegations. I, I omitted to make to uh, make reference to Bylaw 43 2023 which uh, on our addendum does identify a change in um, the ownership so that there's an accurate reflection of the owner of, of the uh, parcels in issue, two numbered companies, uh, and or at least a numbered company, and Mars Homes, so the owners are identified there. Before we move on to the presentations and delegations, I understand, Councillor Christensen, you have a motion you'd like to bring? Yes, Your Worship. Um, I'd like to move that uh, Council approve the request by Mr. Sam Ibrahim to speak to recommendation number two of the Land Committee minutes with respect to uh, the property known as 0-12674 Hiawatha Avenue. Um. Do you have a seconder? Councillor Lewis? 
Uh, any questions or comments on that? All those in favor? None opposed. That is carried. Okay, so then Mr. Abraham will be the um, fourth, fourth delegation to um, address us. And we're going to start with uh, the Fire Chief, Mark Schmidt, who is here and uh, has provided us with an excellent report, but he's going to be speaking about Camp Molly. Good evening, Chief. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm here to present Camp Molly uh, to you. Uh, Camp Molly Niagara was uh, presented or challenged to me by one of my staff members who is on um, the Board of Directors and by a friend who is on the Board of Directors. Um, the concern was is that we may not have enough young ladies here in Fort Erie to meet the 35 requirements. So I brought it to regional chiefs, uh, which was supported by them. Uh, fortunately, Joe Zambito is willing to use his training grounds uh, for Camp Molly. Uh, currently, we're at around uh, 48 applications for 35 spots, so it's going to be become a bit of a challenge to narrow it down to the people we want. Um, Camp Molly uh, represents the first female firefighter uh, recognized in the United States, and it's a camp for young girls between the ages of 15 and 18 uh, to challenge them. Um, to make them look at themselves differently and think outside of what they would normally consider for themselves. So I have a short video presentation that I think Kevin is going to queue up for me. <clears throat> and then I can answer any questions afterwards. for coming and like getting to experience everything it's made me feel more comfortable the girls here are super kind everyone here has the same goals of trying to explore their future and becoming a firefighter do it it's like if you want to join it join it it'll be good and you will enjoy it you have fun it has been incredible it is so cool seeing all these young women getting is be prepared to be challenged, be prepared to be empowered, and be prepared to change the way you see yourself. So Camp Molly is occurring uh, the week the Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday of the Mother's Day weekend um, with a graduation on the Sunday that happened in Niagara Falls and the uh, mother, well, parents, but mothers in particular are welcome to join them on the Sunday uh, to participate in um, a drill which is considered um, combat challenge. So it's done professionally, but the girls are going to go through the, the rigors of the combat challenge along with their mothers if they choose to do so. Any questions? No, thank you very much, Chief. That's that's pretty exciting, and I'm glad to see that we're part of that. Um, Councillor Noyes. If someone was interested in doing it, I know that you have many applications already, but how, if somebody else is still interested, can they also apply, or is it... The, yeah, is the, it's uh, applications are open until the second week of April, and it's through campmolly.ca. Camp? Molly.ca. Thank you. Yep. Any other members of Council? Thank you very much, Chief. Thank you. That then takes us to our second um, delegation. That would be Kaylee Pyatt, who is the Account Manager Zone 2, Niagara Region Municipal Property Assessment Corporation. Good evening, Ms. Pyatt. Good evening. I would, of course, like to start by saying thank you for allowing me to reschedule after I couldn't make it through the snowstorm last month. Um, I appreciate uh, that you've given me some time this evening. Alrighty, so good evening. As it was said, my name is Kaylee Pyatt and I'm the account manager uh, with Municipal and Stakeholder Relations looking after Niagara Region. So I look forward to working with all of you throughout 2023 and beyond. Whether you are a newly elected or seasoned official, please know that MPAC is here to help. We have an entire Municipal and Stakeholder Relations team who are ready to answer any questions that you may have.
There we go. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, at MPAC, we are Ontario's property experts. Our job is to assess and classify more than 5.5 million properties across the province, which have a combined value of over $3 trillion. In the past year, Ontario has grown by approximately 45,000 new residential homes. And in 2022, we added over $37 billion to assessment rolls across the province. Every municipality uses our assessments to make informed decisions about their community, including the distribution of property tax. So we have four key players in the property assessment and taxation system, and they all have a different role to play in this process. So we have the provincial government, specifically the Minister of Finance, who is responsible for setting assessment taxation um, and legislation along with policies. So they will determine the education tax rate. And then we also have an independent uh, body known as the Assessment Review Board, which will adjudicate appeals of MPAC assessments. They also fall under jurisdiction of the province. MPAC is an independent, not-for-profit corporation which is funded by all of Ontario's municipalities. Our role is to accurately assess and classify all properties in Ontario, and we do this in accordance with assessment legislation. We are accountable to the province, municipality, and taxpayers through a board of directors who are comprised of provincial, municipal, and taxpayer representatives. All of board representatives are appointed by the Minister of Finance. So then we come to municipalities who are going to set their budget requirements, uh, set tax rates, and collect property taxes to distribute uh, for services such as police, fire, water, roads, recreation, and much more. Finally, we have property owners who pay the tax bill and help to set what market value is through the ongoing uh, sales and purchases of properties. So as you can imagine, maintaining Ontario's property database is very important. Property data is continuously updated so that municipal records are accurate when our stakeholders are making important tax decisions. Maintaining Ontario's property database includes uh, inspecting and assessing new construction, additions and renovations in a timely fashion, responding to property owner inquiries and assisting them to better understand their assessments. We support municipalities by offering Municipal Connect, which is where our municipal stakeholders can obtain the primary source of assessment related information and we work collaboratively on projects that are important to you, like digital building permits. We have important statutory duties, such as responding to requests for reconsiderations and maintaining and tracking school support of the people data for over 5.5 million properties. So monitoring the market and assessing newly built and renovated properties are some of the things we do every day to keep our property data current. We also periodically update every single property in Ontario based on the same legislated valuation date. We call this an assessment update or a reassessment. The valuation date for the most recent reassessment, which took effect in 2017, was January 1st, 2016. This is when we determined what every single property in Ontario could have reasonably sold for in its current state and condition as of a particular point in time. It is provincial legislation which will determine when MPAC conducts a province-wide assessment update and they will set the valuation date for that assessment cycle. So the reassessment was scheduled to occur in 2020, but was postponed by the province to provide stability and certainty to Ontarians and to enable municipalities to focus on responding to the challenges which were posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. As a result, property assessments continue to be based on the legislated valuation date of January 1, 2016. Although the assessment update remains paused, our work continues to keep property data up to date. Property owners will still receive a property assessment notice from MPAC should any changes take place on their property. In this past November, MPAC sent out almost 800,000 property assessment notices to reflect these changes. Once the province announces when the next assessment update will take place and what the valuation date will be, we will let you know and we're going to work with you to have meaningful conversations as we finalize the new assessed values in your community. So let's talk briefly about valuation in Ontario. There are three industry-wide standardized approaches to value. You have the cost approach, income approach, and the direct comparison approach, which is mainly used for residential, condos, and vacant land. Today I'm going to focus on the direct comparison approach, but should you wish to have a more in-depth conversation about assessment, I can attend training with counsel, and of course I'm here to you individually should you want any extra questions answered. So when it comes to the direct comparison approach, we will analyze recent sales of comparable properties that were sold for a similar or identical use as the property in which we're looking to value. This will provide us with an indication of value for the property. 
And it is important to note that only open market valid sales are used in this analysis. So when we're looking at the valuation of a residential home, although our analysis tool is going to consider over 200 factors, there are five that will make up about 85% of a typical residential home's value. So we're looking at location, uh, lot dimensions, exterior square footage, quality of construction, and the age of the property. Now age of property will be adjusted for any renovations or additions that have taken place over its lifetime. So you may ask what draws our attention to a property, and it's typically one of the following things. A market sale, a request from a municipality or a property owner, building permit activity, or the filing of a request for reconsideration or appeal. MPAC's role is to take building permits and plans and turn them into assessment. Our municipal stakeholders rely on MPAC assessments to levy property tax. The sooner MPAC can deliver assessment, the sooner our municipal stakeholders can realize new revenue. Every year, MPAC processes on average around 300,000 building permits for new construction and renovation. So sometimes property owners do not agree with our assessed value. A property owner might connect with you to let you know that they do not agree with MPAC's assessment. But it is important to remember that assessments are not taxation. Property owners should ask themselves, could I have sold my property on January 1st, 2016 for its current assessed value? They should visit about my property and review the data that MPAC has on file for their home to determine if it's accurate. While on about my property, owners can conduct comparable research on assessments in their areas. If a property owner still disagrees with their assessed value, they have the option to file a request for reconsideration free of charge, and we will review their property's assessment. Alternatively, there is the option to file an appeal with the assessment review board as well. So let's spend a moment to address the relationship between property tax and assessment. Assessments distribute taxes, they do not determine the taxes to be paid. When a province-wide assessment update occurs, the most important factor is not how much the assessed value of a property has changed, but rather how the assessed uh, value of the property has changed relative to other properties in the same class within the community. In anticipation of the next province-wide assessment update, we've implemented a strategy to address misconceptions about the relationship between assessed value and taxes. This includes resources for municipalities that will ensure when an announcement is made that we are here with the support that you need. This digital toolkit is available on MPAC.ca and it can help municipalities, including elected officials, mitigate the misinformation and provide support and resources to educate and inform property owners. In the digital toolkit, you're going to find a video how your property taxes are calculated based on the assessed value of your home. I've linked this video in the presentation on the following slide. We don't have time this evening to watch it, but I definitely recommend that you take the three minutes or so to check it out if you haven't done so already. So with that, I want to again thank you for having me here today, and we definitely want to stay connected. So if not already, please be sure that you subscribe to In Touch, which is our monthly municipal e-newsletter. And this can be done through mpac.ca. You can also send me an email. I'll happily sign you up. And be sure to reach out to me any time that you have questions or are looking for further resources. Thank you very much, Ms. Pyatt. Do any members of council have questions? I have a question. So a house since... 2016, there have been hundreds of thousands of houses built in Ontario. How do you then determine its value having regard to what it might have been worth in 2016, even though it was built, say, in 2021? Absolutely. So as I said, our model is going to look at over 200 factors in the assessment of a home. Our model is looking at the value of homes as of January 1st, 2016. And we're taking that model and we are applying it to a newly built home. So it is being assessed based on 2016, not based on 2021, 2023, when it was constructed. So I guess the conclusion is that the properties in Ontario um, are reflective of what would have been a 2016 value, not current value. That's correct. So what I think the misconception for you with current value is we work with current value as of a particular point in time versus current value here and now. So MPAC's assessed value isn't about what I'm going to sell my house for today. It's what was my house relatively, what was the value of that as of January 1st, 2016. Any other members of council? Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you kindly. Much. Okay, then that takes us to uh, Martha Mason and Monica Bitwood of the Multicultural Centre.
You go ahead. Oh. Okay. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor. Council. Good evening. Okay. I'll wait for. PowerPoint. That's okay. Okay, great. Well, thank you again for giving us an opportunity to tell you a little bit more about the 40-Year Multicultural Center, to discuss the uh, Safe Third Country Agreement, and to dispel some myths and hopefully give you some facts about refugees. The Fort Erie Multicultural Center was founded in 1992. It grew from a movement in the early 1980s after five local families opened their hearts and homes to refugee claimants entering Canada at the Peace Bridge. We continue to welcome newcomers to Canada and provide a continuum of services to support their inclusion and integration into the local community. We offer programs and services which focus both on the personal and legal aspects of a refugee claimant's experience when arriving in Canada and their progress toward permanent residency and citizenship. The Fort Erie Multicultural Center has an office on Jarvis Street, and next door we share space with the Niagara Catholic School Board, Adult Learning Center that teaches English, and our head office is at the Peace Bridge, where we have our Refugee Reception Center and work closely with CBSA, the Canada Border Services Agency. Do we have to do this? Oh, I've, oh, I've got it. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the Safe Third Country Agreement. This agreement between Canada and the USA came into force December 4, 2004, which states that an asylum seeker must make their application for refugee protection in the first country they arrive in. If they arrive first in the USA, that is where they must make their claim, unless they qualify for an exception to the agreement to apply for refugee protection in Canada. There are four exception categories, family member, unaccompanied minor, document holder, and public interest. The main ones, the ones we see at the Fort Erie border crossing, are that the asylum seeker must have an anchor family member with an eligible immigration status living in Canada, or be an unaccompanied minor under age 18 without a parent or guardian present in the USA or Canada. If these exception criteria are not met for asylum seekers, then they are sent back to the USA. The updated agreement, as of March 24th, 2023, applies to asylum seekers who are seeking entry to Canada from USA at all land border crossings, rail stations, and airports. In addition, the updated agreement applies to all crossings between these ports of entries where claims are made less than 14 days after entry. Okay, so, a yeah. things. so just, uh, to, just to clarify, prior to this March 24th agreement, the Safe Third Country exceptions applied only at official borders, of which Fort Erie is one. So this is where we had the Roxham Road-ish situation because it was not an official border and the Safe Third Agreement did not apply there. So under this new update, the Safe Third Agreement will apply at all land borders, whether they're official or not, and all airports and train stations, etc. So it has... Um, um, created um, across the entire land border between Canada and the United States, the criteria for entering Canada. So Canada has uh, a couple different refugee programs. So the Refugee Resettlement Program helps refugees who are outside of Canada and their country of origin in need of protection. People must be referred either by the United Nations Refugee Agency or a designated referral organization or a private sponsorship group. Refugees are resettled in Canada through different resettlement programs, including the Government Assisted Refugees Program and the Private Sponsorship of Refugees Program. The main difference between these programs is the breakdown of the financial and non-financial support from the Government of Canada and private sponsors. So for example, Ukrainians have a special arrangement. Also, there is the in-Canada asylum program. So people arriving at the Canadian port of entry can apply for refugee protection by making a refugee claim to the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada. 
The IRB is an independent administrative tribunal that decides if the claimant qualifies for refugee protection. The IRB will hear a case and make a decision according to two protection categories. A, the Convention refugee has a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside of their country of nationality, is an unable or unwilling to return. A person in need of protection faces the danger of torture, risk to their life, or risk of cruel and unusual treatment or punishment if they return to their home country. So in our community in Fort Erie, this is the person that we generally see um, in our service profile, not the government-sponsored or private-sponsored refugee. There have been some Ukrainians that come have that are living in our community, and in the Syrian crisis several years ago, uh, we had, I believe, four or five families that were sponsored by one of the or two of the local churches. Uh, but typically, we see the refugee claimant in our community in our work. So, a couple myths versus facts. Refugees jump the queue over other more deserving immigrants. Refugees are forced to flee their homes, while economic immigrants have the ability to choose where and when to move. Canada recognizes this by having completely separate programs for refugees and economic immigrants. There is no queue. Secondly, refugees are a security risk to Canada. Refugees are trying to escape violence and come to Canada for safety. There are very thorough security checks throughout the asylum process, and refugees are much more likely to be victims of violence than the perpetrators of violence. Another miss, refugees get more money than Canadian pensioners. The amount of financial support that refugees get is based on provincial social assistance rates, and these may vary a little bit for government-sponsored refugees. It is the minimum amount needed to cover basic food and shelter, they may also be eligible for support from a variety of agencies for legal aid, language instruction, and other basic needs. Refugees are secure. Oh, I went. <laughs> there we go. Myths versus fact. Refugees take jobs from Canadians. Immigration has always been the driving force behind Canada's labor supply. Job vacancies are much higher than before COVID-19, and with the working age population aging, high levels of immigration are even more important to the Canadian labour market. Most newcomers are eager to work, they bring diversity and unique skills, and are very entrepreneurial, creating jobs for themselves and others. We actually have in town many uh, refugees who have started businesses here and continue to do so successfully. So in regards to the hotel accommodations, there has been a surge in refugee claimants at Roxham Road in Quebec, a reflection of the pattern seen globally with an estimated 4.5 million displaced individuals. The federal government is trying to alleviate the stress on Quebec by relocating individuals to cities such as Cornwall, Windsor, Niagara Falls, and cities in Atlantic provinces. Niagara Falls currently has nine hotels accommodating refugee claimants. They are being served on site by our organization and other agencies such as the Welland Heritage Council, Centre de Sante, Communitaire, YMCA Niagara Newcomer Services, Niagara Region, Ontario Works, and Legal Aid. The school boards are doing their best to make room for school-aged children, and there is a wait list for adults to attend English language training. So our Newcomer Centre at the Peace Bridge is the only one of its kind in Canada serving refugee claimants. We provide food and refreshments. We provide a place to rest while claimants are going through their eligibility process, which can take all day. Information on next steps in the refugee claim process as there's some very time-specific uh, requirements for them to do their claims. And also referrals to destination organizations for assistance. So we face many challenges right now. There are many challenges facing the refugee claimants and organizations like ourselves. For one, it's a very politically charged topic with a lot of misinformation and lack of understanding of Canada's responsibilities and systems. Climate change, violence and conflict are the main contributors to the large amounts of displaced individuals and trends show it only increasing. The recent changes to the Safe Third Country Agreement may result in a large increase to claimants at formal borders. We've noticed over the years, whenever there's a change like that, we do, you know, initially we may see a little bit of a downtick, but it does rise again. 
Um, while we are funded by the provincial and federal governments and organizations like the United Way, we have very limited resources to work with the claimants staying in hotels in Niagara Falls, in addition to those being served at the border. Uh, one of the, just uh, another myth that you may have heard about is that, and, and I believe it's been in the media consistently, is that one of the challenges of the Safe Third Agreement is that once a, a claimant a, arrives in Canada, they're automatically returned to the United States. And that is not actually true. They will be returned if they do not meet the exception criteria. In Fort Erie, we have a very sophisticated system of information provision through our partners in the United States who help to prepare claimants before they come so that they understand the, the system and they understand what's required from them to prevent the risk of their being returned. A person who is returned to the United States without status is at risk of being um, imprisoned or de de um, destabilize with their family and so on. In Fort Erie, because of our system, we have a very uh, significant success rate. Only 3% of the people who come to us prepared are returned to the United States. And over the years, we, um, we've seen over 40,000 people through this agreement who have successfully come into the country based on the agreement. Whether we agree with the Safe Third Country Agreement or not isn't the issue as much as it is our responsibility to uh, work with the, the regulations that are provided to us. The agreement, the Safe Third Country Agreement right now is before the Supreme Court of Canada in terms of the question is whether it's constitutional. So this is still to be decided uh, in terms of uh, the rights um, of refugees who are seeking um, so, um, asylum at our borders. And I'd also like to formally invite Council to come visit us at the Newcomer Centre. It is a very, very unique uh, space and we have hosted many dignitaries over the year uh, over the years governments tend to bring people there to show it off even though they're not paying for it uh, <laughs> but um, yes yeah, it's it's a really it's a great uh, space very unique and um, I know CBSA and, and ourselves work very closely and it's been a very successful relationship um, that goes both ways so thank you again for giving us the opportunity, and we'd like to open it up to questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Ms. Mason and Ms. Vogt. Do any members of council have any questions? Councillor Christensen. Uh, thank you very much for what you do. I think it's very, very important to protect people across the world who legitimately need to come here. Um, I'd like to ask about uh, your, your uh, language resources. Um, I know you're a small organization, and uh, I'm, I'm just curious about uh, how you meet the language needs and the interpreter uh, translation needs when people come to the country. Okay. At, at the uh, reception center, um, we have an employee who speaks uh, four languages, French, English, Spanish, and Creole. And um, it, amongst our staff, we also have uh, Dari Farsi and Persian. And uh, our uh, relationship with CBSA does allow us to tap into some of their interpreters as well. One of the things at the center that um, helps the claimants, as particularly those who make an appointment in advance, is that the translator is on. So whatever the language may be, if we do not have access to it, then, um, then we, can, we can enable it through the Canada Border Service Agency. Um, we, do, we also use Google Translate from time to time because that's just something that comes in handy. Um, it's not official that we need to uh, translate documents or anything, so it's mostly about just making sure that people understand the information that we're trying to impart to them. Anything further, Councillor Christians? Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I had a couple of questions, and the first question is, in order to um, respond to what may be an impending flood of uh, asylum seekers at Fort Erie, are you folks um, taking some action or seeking assistance for some of the needs that you might have? We're doing some preliminary planning with CBSA. We're meeting with them again on Thursday 
Um, it's a very difficult thing to forecast at this point. We were expecting to see a large number over the weekend, but that didn't happen. We actually had staff on site over the weekend. We're not normally there unless they call us. So it might be, uh, we have heard through media that um, the news about this is, is quite slow getting out there. So it might just be coming later. In terms of resources, um, we are limited and you know we do our best um, we have been working at the hotels as well so as a there is a capacity issue and we sometimes have to just focus on what's most important on that specific day or for that specific person the the claimants at the hotel are very vulnerable because they haven't been fully processed they have to go back for their eligibility interview and it's delaying all of their um, process. They, they haven't yet been referred to the Immigration Board for their hearing. So what we're trying to do is simply just uh, help them reflect on the situation, that, that the reality of the situation. And, um, you know, as I say, we're just doing the best we can with our capacity. Um, we have sought out new resources, but as yet we're, we haven't heard whether they're going to be made available. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, we work, we work bi-weekly with the IRCC. Um, they've been very helpful, you know, the, the governments. And again, the responsibility, it's a little bit odd because federal is responsible for one part of the refugee process and, and provincial is responsible um, for basically the initial part of it. Um, so it gets a little bit, you know, who's responsible for what. But um, they, they've been as accommodating as they can, but we're certainly challenged with resources. Thank you. Well, I commend your organization and all those who have been working with our asylum seekers, refugees, newcomers over the past 40 years now. Um, and if there is anything that um, we can assist you with, I know that you corresponded with us last month to kind of raise this issue. If there is anything that we can assist you with, please let us know in the future. Okay, Thank and you. certainly too, if you'd like to visit or yeah. if you have any questions in the meantime or if a media article grabs you and you'd like clarification, they tend to be not always clear, so. Um, let us know, and we, we'll be certain to, to shatter the myths for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm quite familiar with your facility. It's a wonderful, wonderful facility. So thank, thank you. you very much for coming thank out you. this evening. Thank, thank you. you very much. You're okay. welcome. That then takes us to our final delegation, and that is Mr. Sam Abraham. Good evening, sir. Good evening. And I don't want to encourage you to take 10 minutes, but... You have a ten It'll be very minute. quick. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Um, and Joe, thank you so much for helping me navigate um, all of this. Um. <clears throat> okay. Oh, just no. Okay. Um. So I stand before you today in hopes that you will consider our family's request to purchase a piece of city land, um, namely 0-12674 Hiawatha Avenue, um, which is a lot, uh, abutting a lot that we recently purchased only a few months ago. Um, so I just want to provide a little bit of context as to why I'm here and why I'm asking for this. Um, so we're a multicultural family of five, myself and my wife, we have three young daughters, and we're looking to relocate to Fort Erie. Um, my wife's aging parents uh, recently moved here, and they live on Ridge Road. Uh, my brother-in-law lives on Peach Street, which is actually in the neighborhood of the Hiawatha property as well. And my sister-in-law and her now new baby um, live in off of Green Acres Drive in Fort Erie. Um, we are upstanding community members. Um, we own several small businesses that would also be relocated to Fort Erie. We have a successful cleaning company. Um, I own a food truck. Um, and we also have small advertising company and online marketing, that sort of stuff. Um, we're hoping to be closer to our family so that we can participate in their lives and assist with our aging parents. Um, so this is just an overview of the area. So we have uh, property number one and we're looking to also purchase property number two so that we can build our dream home. Um, a little bit of history. So we did purchase uh, the property number one um, after doing some due diligence. Um, prior to purchase, we spoke to someone in zoning, namely Mohammed Kamruzaman, um, and he told us the lot was too small to support a septic system. Um, however, he did advise us that the, the abutting lot on Hiawatha was owned by the town and 
could potentially be sold to us if we, uh, with a formal request. Um, he was confident that with the merging of the two lots, we would be able to support a septic system, and he, re he referred us to Devin Haluka to confirm. So Devin is the private sewage systems inspector for Niagara region. So we spoke to him and we showed him the lots, um, and he confirmed that the two lots combined would support a septic system. Um, so given that the purchase opportunity for lot number one was time limited, we moved forward with uh, closing on the property um, and then proceeded to um, make this request. Um, sorry. So we do understand that the abutting property is small um, and that our request does not fall within the land sale policy guidelines. Um, for from what we understand is primarily due to lack of the ability to install a septic system But we just wanted to let you know that our plan is to merge the two lots um, And we're more than willing to provide a condition of sale that indicates we will merge both lots um, Such that the land side falls into compliance with the septic septic zoning regulations um, And I just have some images um, So this is sort of the family home that we had in mind um, My wife put this one together um, gives you an idea of, of the size of the home that could be put on the property once they're merged. Um, and this is just another picture of the septic system overview. So this is relatively to scale. So it shows, um, and this was um, based on um, information that we received from Devon, um, about the repair area, sorry, and the size of the septic field that would be needed. Um, and then we just did an overlay to show what it would look like on the actual property itself. So that's all I have. I thank you so much for your time and consideration and um, really hope you consider our request. Thank you, thank you much, so Mr. much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ibrahim. Before you go, yes. are there any members of council that have any questions right now? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. So that takes us to the consent agenda. And uh, Councillor Christensen, you have the resolution, but before I move there, are there any reports that any, or any items that anyone wishes removed from the consent agenda? Okay, well, I'd like PDS 26-2023 removed so that we can ask um, questions of staff with respect to that. Councillor McDermott? Uh, yes, uh, this Okay, so that would be item 2A. That's from the Niagara region? Yes. Any others? If not, Councillor Christensen, could you read the resolution to put the consent agenda less item 2A and PDS 26, 2023 on the floor? And, and report PDS 26, 2023. 20, 26, 2023. 2023, okay. Um, so the consent agenda is on the floor for any questions or comments, less those two items. Councilor Noyes. Um, thank you, Mayor Rinnikoff. Um, H, the Crystal Beach your Business Improvement Area Board of Management, just a question on the minutes. And find my question. It had to do with the liability um, to the town in regards to that they're talking about um, like having a bus or a trolley system or something else like that. I'm sorry, where are you again? That would be on page. What's the item again? It is H. 193H, boards and committees? Yes. Crystal Beach BIA, okay. Now, just, just want some clarification in regards to liability to the town if, if, they, if they hire a, if they're talking about a tour, a shuttle service, like a tour. If they do have that, what would be the liability to the town, if any, difference? Mr. McQueen, can you comment on that? Or is that something you'd need to get some information on? 
um, through the chair, I think there was a takeaway, and um, Mr. Jensen may want to um, interject as well. But I believe our um, manager of procurement was looking into the insurance issue because there was some confusion, I think, with the Crystal Beach BIA about coverages and where uh, the coverages began and uh, ended. And so that may be another one. Um, there wasn't one other issue that we were investigating the insurance coverage on. It was a, an event-based one. So if we can maybe just take that back, if you're okay with that, and maybe get some clarification back to Council about proper coverage. I think we're going to work directly with the BIA uh, to do some clarification on what the insurance does cover and where they may be required to uh, obtain additional insurance for specific events or, or venues. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, that answers that, but I do have other others. Yep. Um, CAO 08 2023, the Boys and Girls Club of Niagara subleasing portion of the EJ Freeland Community Center. Um, I just wanted, th this is wonderful news. It's wonderful that the, the children who will be treated by the Children's Center will now hopefully be treated in, in Fort Erie and not have to go to St. Catharines. So I think it's a win-win. But I do wonder what services, do we have any idea what services are going to be offered there? Or is that still a, a work in progress? Mr. McQueen, would you know that? Would you have some specificity on that? And was it referred to in any of the documents that were passed on? No, we don't have any specific information about the services there. I think that was one of the things there. They were hoping to work through um, the sublease agreement, find out if it was an option first. And then I think they're going to have discussions about what services they can reasonably operate out of there uh, as a pilot to start. So I think we could get more information once uh, once they have the okay to move forward. And you'll circulate that information to council? Uh, yes, we can do that. I, I guess my next question is, and, and just to, I'm, I'm assuming it'll be non-for-profit, um, people who will be providing services in this building, not, not sub, like the Children's Center can't subcontract it to somebody else who's basically a for-profit organization. Mr. McQueen? Uh, uh, through the chair, uh, Councillor Noyes, you're correct. Yeah, it was the um, the sublease is specific for the operations of Niagara Children's Center. Thank you. I think. I think that was it. Thank you. Any other members of council on any of the items still in the consent agenda? If not, then. Uh, I just wanted to comment on um, the uh, year-end fire department report and how well done that was. Um, and congratulations, Chief. Looks like a successful year, and it looks like you're gearing up for another successful year post-pandemic. Okay, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor of the items still in the consent agenda? None opposed. That is carried. So let's, uh, Councillor Christensen, Christensen, I wonder if you could put item 2A uh, on the floor. That is the uh, correspondence from Niagara Region. Yeah, you just need to move that, and uh, Council McDermott, I'm sure, will be your seconder. Okay. I'd like to move uh, item 2A onto the floor. Councillor McDermott. Seconded by Councillor McDermott. Okay, so that's on the floor. Councillor McDermott, would you like to speak to this? Yeah, thank you, Worship. Um, I guess I want, to, I, I want to commend the region for moving this uh, forward. And it's uh, my hope that uh, we could receive and support this. You know, uh, amongst many things that we have, I mean, we have homelessness here. We have mental health issues. We have opioid addiction, fentanyl problems. Um, I spend a, a good amount of time uh, talking to the regional police about these matters. And, you know, it just seems to get worse. I um, go to the bank on the weekends, and uh, very rarely do I not see somebody um, warming at the bank because they don't have a place to, to live, and it doesn't look like they've had a meal in a while. I think this is very important. Uh, the only dilemma with bringing this to the region was the fact that 
it's got to be moved up the chain of command to the province. So it's a, it's a good thing to move forward. It's a good thing for us when we maybe go to AMO to talk more about this. Like, it's, it's really serious problems. As far as the drug part of it, you know, I know. I, I spend most of my time uh, dealing with the police on uh, drug issues, and they've been very kind about um, getting right on things. And uh, some people are moving out of the ward now, and some have been arrested, and some are being watched. But these problems are never going to go away if, if the people who are responsible for taking matters under their hands, which is the province, doesn't recognize and do something about this. I mean, if we're not, if we're not careful, we're going to lose a generation of people because of this. And I understand why. I mean, there's so many pressures on people uh, post-COVID. I mean, that's just knocked the crap out of everybody. And this gets magnified by issues like that. So uh, we just um, like to move that we uh, receive, and, uh, re receive and support this. And uh, hopefully, Council will do that for me. Seconder, Councilor Lewis. Um, before we move on to the vote, Mr. McQueen, did you want to make any comments about some of the things that you've been engaged in with uh, other parties relative to at least some of what's referred to here? particularly the opioid um, um, addiction. I can advise council that I had a meeting uh, earlier today with uh, Dr. Kazmani, who's the point man for public health with respect to um, the, um, the substance abuses, and uh, he'll have further discussions with um, Mr. McQueen with respect to how we can at least do some things locally. But Mr. McQueen, maybe you can just give us a brief update uh, relative to what you've been engaged in so far. Dr. Kazmani said that he very much appreciated working with you, as does um, the region, uh, because of your deep ties with, uh, with the region. Thank you through the chair. Yes, I have some familiarity with public health uh, from my work history, but um, we did have a good meeting with uh, public health to discuss the issue, and uh, Councilor McDermott is absolutely right. It's a very comprehensive issue. Um, in, includes a lot of different stakeholders, federally, provincially, at the region and, and here at the town. So we have talked about some strategies, although they may be somewhat reactive to some of the symptoms of uh, what's happening with homelessness and the opioid crisis, but we are looking at the town to pilot some uh, programs around um, safe, sharps disposal, training to our staff, information out to the public on, you know, how to handle stray needles. Uh, there is... Um, some prospect of naloxone kit rollout, uh, engaging the business community in a different way. Um, and then beyond that, uh, as the mayor referenced, Dr. Kazmani, they are looking at a more comprehensive strategy that is more around uh, prevention, community outreach, and a number of other things that we would like to be able to support as a town. So uh, it will be a coordinated sort of cross-agency effort uh, to start moving forward. But in the short run, we would like to get at least some promotional information out, access to resources and uh, services uh, where residents or um, people at, in need uh, can reach out and know where to reach those resources. So those are some of the promotional things more in the short term. Uh, we're hoping to get off the ground some sometime very soon. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, anything further, Councilor McDermott, before I go to other members of Council? Your Worship, this is exactly the type of stuff that we need when we're trying to uh, look for funding. Um, a lot of people don't know about it or know, don't know where they can go for help. Or, so I, I think uh, it's incumbent on us to educate them in one way, shape, or form, whether that's on our website or whether it's flyers or whether it's advertising. So I certainly appreciate that effort. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Any other members of Council? Council uh, Councilor Noyes. Uh, thank you, Mayor Redick. Um, I just have a question, and I'm all for it, and I don't want it to be taken wrong, but about uh, F on page 3, about decriminalizing personal use. Uh, and if you read that sentence further, and possession of substances, and I'm not quite sure exactly what that means. I can understand that you, if someone is for personal use and they're addicted, and I understand it's an illness, but what do they exactly mean, possession of substances? Sub possession of substances for themselves? 
for 25 other people. It's not really clarified in there if we're for the decriminalization. I can understand personal use, and you don't throw the person in jail and he has a a history against him and felony, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and really, as he's trying to, or he or she is trying to get themselves better. But what about the possession of substances? Like, there, there's no clarification. It doesn't necessarily refer to personal use, or I just don't like that open-ended comment. Which item are you in again? That is F on page three. Two F. Okay, is it 2F? Okay. Yeah, it's 2F on page 3. And if you go down, it says, to federal government to decriminalize personal use and possession of substances and ensure increased investment in health and social services. It's the possession of substances that I wish there would be more clarification because that could mean anything. So this ties in with um, item number uh, 5, uh, where the, the request is that the federal government explore um, the legal regulation and decriminalization of drugs in Canada. The item that you referred to is part of uh, eight items that the um, Association of Le Local Public Health Agencies uh, adopted and has uh, sought endorsement for across the province. So that's something that the Association of Local Public Health Agencies um, have come up with, which was... Um, endorsed by the region, and that's why it's part of this particular motion. And thank you for that explanation. I still don't like the way it's written in regards to the possession of substances. I wish there was more clarification. That's as much clarification as I can provide you. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else? Councillor Lewis. Thank you, Your Worship. And just a couple of comments. Thank you, um, um, Councillor um, McDermott, for bringing this up. Um, and also, Your Worship, for um, asking for further conversation um, in your email earlier this week. Um, I just wanted to make one comment in terms of the needles in the park, and I don't think the pub general public knows that those really need to be called into public health so that they're logged and the locations are, are tracked. Um, and if areas do become an area, this is at least my understanding, an area where it's um, frequent use, that data being collected is quite helpful. So I do hope that when staff are putting together the resources to go out to the public, um, we do take some time to highlight that, especially for the parks and um, some of the business cores, because I, I do hear or see on Facebook or social media individuals picking them up and getting rid of them, which is great, but I think the data collection is also gonna be most helpful there. Yep, for sure, and Mr. McQueen, I know that you've had discussions with Dr. Kazmani about that, and. You'll be following that up, I'm sure. Uh, anyone else wish to uh, comment on this? Back to you, Councillor Noyes. Um, thank you, the Mayor. I'm, I'm not going to support this the way it's written. Um, not that I'm not for all mental health and, and all of the good things that are in it. I just would need more explanation on the decriminalization of all drugs in Canada and also um, personal, you know, no, no charges for personal, no charges or whatever for personal use, for possession of substances. I just, I just don't feel I have enough confidence in what I'm reading that that's exactly what I would be for. Well, I, I can tell you, other, other than what I can tell you, which is that Dr. Kazmani's position with respect to this, and he raised it during our conversation, was that um, drug addiction, substance abuse should be considered a health issue, not a criminal justice issue. And so therefore, people are discouraged from seeking assistance, um, and those around them are somewhat discouraged from seeking assistance if it's treated criminally as opposed to as a public health issue. So that's, I think, the rationale. Um, you can accept uh, that or uh, it may not be adequate information, but that's the extent of what I know about this. Okay, if there are no other questions or comments, all those in favor of Council McDermott's motion to support and receive this? Opposed? That is carried. Um, Councilor Christensen, then, could you and Councilor McDermott uh, move that item PDS 26 2023 uh, be put on the floor for discussion. Thank you. So that um, report is on the floor. This is the report that deals with the request for pre servicing by the um, 
owners of the Harbor Town Village a draft plan of subdivision. Any questions or comments? Councillor Noyes. Thank you, Mayor Riddick. We did get an email this afternoon on this. We did. And I'm just wondering, and it pretty much, I think, explains a lot of the details, but the one thing about the bird, about the uh, woodpecker, I'm just needing some more, something that, that we can, the red-headed woodpecker endangered species, um, every other condition has been satisfied, um, but, but this cannot happen, and just a little bit more explanation, so I have a better, I just read it, like, an hour ago, so I'm not I'm not fully um, vetted on exactly what that means. That this is this is the one condition that's not satisfied. Big pardon. Is that right? Is that the one condition that's not satisfied? There's a, a letter from the ministry that's um, still required. Uh, apparently, the the ecological company that looked at it did clear it, but Mr. Um, Herlovich, can you comment on that? This is condition 60. Yes, thank you, Worship. Uh, so you to the councillor, the condition requires that the owner contact the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks to determine whether or not there are any permitting requirements before um, uh, proceeding with the development. So the uh, consultant has provided a study to the Ministry of the Environment stating that in the year since um, this um, approval was given, no uh, red-headed woodpeckers have been sighted, and they're therefore seeking advice that no further permitting requirements are necessary. So they're waiting for that response. And that no response would be part of clearing the conditions of draft plan approval. Councillor Noyes. Um, thank you for that, and I do apologize for not asking that question earlier in a telephone call. Um, I, I guess my before we, we received this, I had a question about the the timing of the development. Is that one of the reasons, perhaps, that they're doing the pre-servicing? Isn't there like a time frame where they can and they can't do some um, building or development because of the because of the nesting season? Uh, Mr. Hurlovich. Do you, Your Worship? To the councillor, um, most of the trees are gone where they would be doing the servicing, so I don't think that's the issue. I think it's uh, the desire to get in there early. They would like to have the servicing in place for the fall, and so uh, they just want to get an early start. Thank you. That's all. Anyone else? Councillor Flagg. Thank you. Through you to Mr. Living. I notice on the on the actual report when it um, speaks about the budget that it um, one hundred percent of the primary services external excluding town cost sharing. Could, could you elaborate a little bit on what the town cost sharing portion of this might be? Yep. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Hurlovich. Uh, I'll try and help to the best of my ability. Um, one of the requirements that um, is in place as a condition of uh, approval is the reconstru reconstruction of Bassett Avenue and, uh, and the uh, installation of services on, on Bassett. And so a port, the west side of Bassett is already developed, the east side of Bassett is not. That's part of the Harbour Town development. And so the cost sharing would be that the town would pick up its share of the portion of Bassett that's already developed. I believe that's what it's referring to. So that's, yes. so that's basically the developer will pay for his side, which is 50% of the length. The town will pay for the opposite side where the existing houses are. Councillor Flagg. Thank you for that. One more question. The tree protection plan that was submitted, is that submitted directly to the region, does not come through the town, is that correct? Mr. Hurlovich, uh, can you shed some light yeah, on that? Yeah, through your, your worship. No, the tree plan was submitted to the town, and then it was forwarded to the region, which is now the approval authority. It was at one time the conservation authority, but those um, uh, powers have been reverted to the region. Councilor Flagg. Thank you. Nothing further. Any other members of council? So, so Mr. Hurlovich, just dealing with where, we, where Councilor Flagg left off, the um, 
how did it come about that the trees were permitted to be removed pursuant to a tree severance plan in light of the wording of condition 56, which I think you're familiar with, um, which talks about no trees being removed until a number of things have been done, including final approval for the subdivision. Yes, so your worship, the uh, you're correct, 56, condition 56 says no tree removal, grading, or soil disturbance. However, the condition 37 requires that there be an archaeological assessment completed before the conditions um, can be cleared. And in order to uh, uh, do the archaeological assessment, part of what they have to do, or one of the ways in which they do the archaeological assessment, is to uh, scrape the soil to see whether or not there is any evidence of disturbance or archaeological um, elements. And so in order to do that, the trees had to be removed so they could do the investigative work. So is that a dialogue, if I might, that would have occurred between the developer and the region, the developer and the town, the developer and the town and the region? How would, how would that have played out? Because um, what you're suggesting is then that the entire site needed to be cleared in order for archaeological work to be done. Uh, so the tree preservation plan identified which trees were to be uh, retained. Uh, we do have a copy of that. It would be available for anyone to look at. Um, so it, it was largely around the perimeter, uh, some around that stormwater pond, and then the buffer area next to uh, the two environmental protection blocks. The balance of those lands, basically the trees were being removed in their entirety. So the region would have looked at the tree uh, preservation plan and accepted it or rejected it. In this case, they accepted the, the findings of the tree preservation plan. And then in consultation with uh, town staff um, and regional staff, which the region's responsible for reviewing the archeological study, basically permission was granted that they cut the trees so they could do the archeological study so that they could satisfy condition 37. With respect to condition 37, the memo that we received this afternoon indicates that the, all the archaeological work has been done, that um, a report has been filed with the ministry, and um, that condition hasn't been cleared yet because the ministry um, has not sent its formal letter acknowledging that uh, no further work needs to be done. That's uh, correct. Sorry. So is... I guess my question is that condition and the condition that deals with the um, red-headed woodpecker and the endangered species, which again, we're waiting for something from the ministry. Is it appropriate to be um, permitting site servicing prior to being assured that those archaeological and endangered species reports, or at least uh, letters from the ministry have been received? Um, it's not essential. In fact, if they are digging for the services and they encounter any artifacts, uh, which, you know, if there's potential of that, uh, they will know those areas. So if they're digging, they will have to cease uh, to dig and they will have to contact the ministry and archaeological resources will be called into the site. That's because there's a condition that specifically states that, the yes, condition of approval. Um, there's also... Um, There's also a reference to um, the vernal pools, and um, the region apparently cleared that condition in February. Can you comment about how, how that all works out, the stormwater management pond, the vernal pools, and how that relates to site servicing and ultimate approval of the plan of subdivision? So the, uh, yes, Your Worship, the vernal pools are part of that stormwater system. So the, the vernal pools were, um, I'm going to say authorized by the Ontario Land Tribunal in granting its um, approval of draft plan approval. The vernal pools then would collect the water. I don't know if you, anybody's familiar with that uh, stormwater pond. It, you know, it's a large, basically um, deep and uh, abrupt uh, pond. So the idea is the vernal pools would allow 
amphibians and uh, other species to, to breed on the shores of the pond, uh, the stormwater ponds. They form part of that whole ecosystem. The conditions of draft plan approval require that those vernal pools be uh, fed with uh, clean water. That water would be coming from drainage swales and uh, stormwater that's collected on the uh, Harbour Town property. So a amount of that stormwater will be um, directed to the vernal pools that would then allow for the, uh, as I say, the um, areas to be developed for us. Uh, uh, species breeding and will help then allow that water to slowly infiltrate into the ground. So that's part of how the stormwater will drain. And the uh, stormwater management facility and the vernal pools, that's all part of the servicing of the property? Yes, the, yes, the vernal pools form part of the servicing scheme, the stormwater portion. There is a provision uh, in the conditions that, that suggests that um, there's to be consultation with respect to plantings around the vernal pools and I think in the corridor that runs north-south on the property. What would the timing of that be? Uh, yeah, that, that will be af after the pools or are, are ponds are, are established, but the plans will come in um, probably just about the time that the plan or the subdivision is registered. So just before, just after registration, of the plan, I would expect the planting um, drawings to be submitted. And the significance of registration of the plan of subdivision is what? That no actual lots for building are, are created and no building permits can be issued until that plan of subdivision is uh, approved and registered? That's correct. There's a, there's a few conditions that seem to have, um, are also of concern to, to members of the community. The first has to do with Block 107 which uh, Condition 52 says is supposed to be designated um, as environmental protection. Has that been done yet? Yes, Your Worship, that has been done. That was part of the documents that were at the Ontario Land Tribunal, okay. and they were um, amended and, and approved by the uh, tribunal at that time so that, um, the, as, as you're aware, some of the lands that were supposed to be uh, lots and a road were added into Lot 107, and so therefore um, the zoning schedule and the official plan schedule were amended at that time as part of the submission before OLT. And Condition 29 talks about Block 107 being conveyed uh, to the municipality, or if not the municipality, some other um, agency. Um, what's your, what's your um, comment with respect to the status of that? So yes, th those lands are to, so the Conservation Authority uh, is not interested in acquiring the lands, therefore they will come to the town, that has generally been, been agreed. Um, so there's a portion of the lands that are to be dedicated to the town free of charge for parkland. A portion of those lands are to be dedicated to the town free of charge as environmental protection, and a portion of the lands are to be purchased by the town and the, uh, the town has agreed to the amount uh, of the purchase price. So that will happen um, simultaneously with the registration. So the deeds will be prepared for transfer to, of this property to the town, and um, the, the monies will exchange hands just as any property sale would be registered at the registry office. Contemporaneously and with the registration of the... Plan of subdivision. That's correct. For the subdivision agreement. Um, and uh, Mr. Jansen, I don't know if you've been following this, but um, my recollection is that money was budgeted for 2023 to acquire these lands in the Harbor Town development. Um, I don't know. I believe it was a capital budget item that was approved uh, back in November. Yeah, I'd have to go and look at that, but I believe uh, that was approved. Sorry, I should have given you a heads up. It has been approved. It's six hundred and fourteen thousand okay. dollars. Um, and Mr. Hurlovich, you're nodding your head, so you're aware of that. Uh, your Worship, that's correct. Um, also, there was some concern about some setbacks referred to in some of the um, some of the conditions near the end of the uh, list of conditions of draft approval. 
um, and those when would those setbacks be be established in terms of zoning? Uh, Your Worship, so uh, the zoning bylaw is already in place, so those setbacks uh, already uh, exist. That would require you know require the uh, the buffer area. The condo apartment building that's proposed for Block 85 would be subject to a site plan agreement, and that site plan agreement would address uh, those buffer lands. But in addition to that, uh, that condo Block 85 and three other lots, 12, thir uh, 11, 11, 12, and 13, rather, uh, all of those would be subject to a conservation agreement. Uh, that agreement's yet to be uh, prepared, so or easement, I should say. So that easement would basically say, thou shalt not disturb this natural area. So anybody who buys lot 11, for instance, would that, they, that agreement would then be binding on them. And, and I that, think, sorry? Right, and, those, and the conservation easements that applies to those three lots can't be registered until such time as the lots have been created. Again, that's correct, And yes. that would be when the subdivision, uh, the subdivision agreement is registered. Yes, that's right. Okay. And just um, if, you, if you might, uh, Mr. Herlovich, if council approves the, the um, pre-servicing, um, there was one. Oh, sorry. There was one other condition, and that had to do with metal detection. And my recollection is that that came up during the the meeting this morning with uh, Mr. Thompson. Sorry. Yeah. Um, relative to the conditions, that was the one that had to do with uh, some metal detection work, and that was a condition added in by the um, minutes of settlement. Do you, do you recall that? I am aware that the uh, there is a condition requiring metal detection. Uh, that would pro probably be associated with the archaeological survey, again, looking for, for buttons, um, um, you know, shot and so on that might have been uh, used in earlier times. Can you just confirm, I know it's not, it's not specifically mentioned in Mr. Johnson's memo to us, could you um, confirm and notify council whether that condition has been met? My recollection is he said this morning that it had been, uh, but perhaps you could clarify that for us between now and next week in the event uh, this resolution is passed. I'll look for that. I believe, again, it's part of that archaeological report, so I think it should be uh, possible to identify. And then, and then finally, can you just give us an indication of how this, how this would roll out? Um, if Council were to approve the recommendation contained in this report, what are, the, what are the steps that need to be taken in order for any acts, any action to take place on that parcel now in terms of site servicing? Uh, yeah, so they will need uh, the, we'll have to actually, um, we have a draft of the agreement, the agreement will be signed. Uh, we would then, then uh, authorize the construction of those uh, services. There would be uh, field staff which, who would attend the site to ensure the, uh, correct installation of the of the services so my understanding is that there there has to be uh, an agreement a site servicing agreement as you mentioned that has to be reviewed by the lawyers uh, that's correct and then there's a pre-construction meeting that has to take place between the owner and the contractor and uh, their consultant the region and the town yes and then um, there also has to be some notification to residents who live in the Bassett uh, and Edgewood Avenue areas about pending construction in their neighborhood, which is what Councillor Flagg had asked about? That's correct. They would be alerted to uh, the, the imminent construction of their street. And then there has to be a permit issued by the region with respect to any works required along um, Dominion Road on the road allowance. That's, that's correct. It is the uh, region's road. And in terms of the recommendation itself, it talks about approvals and certificates and what have you. So there are some of those that still need to be obtained? They would need to be t or obtain those from the uh, appropriate agencies and ministries. Okay, and then I understand there's some other um, steps that are required through the Ministry of Labor and also uh, through um, the WSIB. And then there's some water distribution, testing, and disinfection planning that has to be provided? Yeah, those are provincial requirements they would have to meet. Um, now, 
My final question, and I appreciate the, uh, the information you've been providing. While, if the site servicing is permitted, does anybody monitor it from the town or the region? The, yes, the town staff would be attending the site. You know, and you already identified the need to, uh, to visit the site prior to any construction and then while the construction is going on. So staff attends the site to, uh, to observe the uh, use of granular fill, the installation of the, the pipes, the, and so on. All of that is uh, recorded. Okay, and then finally, can you um, alert members of council to the receipt of any uh, clearance letters from the ministry with respect to either Condition 60 or the archaeological assessment um, as soon as they come in? Yes, we can bring that to council's attention through an email. Okay, are there any other questions that members of council have? Councilor McDermott. I'm just going to say no, Your Worship, because you pretty much covered the questions I was concerned about. My my big thing is that um, that the agreements that the community voices had in their um, appeal um, were being met. That was my basic thing, and it, it looks like they had them. So I'm. Um I'm, I'm assuming, Mr. Hurlovich, that the town staff's position is that they have either been met or will be adequately met. And I take that yep. town staff's so, position. So, to you, Your Worship, to the council, yes, there's an obligation to consult with the uh, with the vo uh, community voices group, and uh, that doesn't mean that they get to approve or object to these. It's an opportunity to con um, confer. They can certainly express, you know, in terms of, say, vernal pools or to consult on the plantings. They would have input on those plantings. Um, so they provide input. They've been consulted. Thank you. And what I would say, Councilor McDermott, is there are members of Community Voices here this evening. Um, I'm, I'm counting on the fact that if there is continuing concern or disagreement, we're going to hear from them. And then, uh, and I'm sure we'll hear from them before next Monday. Uh, anything further? Any other counselor? I'm going to call the question with respect to the report and the recommendation. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. That um, takes us then past the uh, consent agenda. And uh, I think we're going to just continue on. And we'll let those who wish, um, if any of you wish to leave, you may do so right now. Councilor McDermott, you have, um, <laughs> so the, the first item up is the land committee minutes. And I've declared a conflict with respect to item two under new business. And you are the mover of the general resolution. So I wonder if we could have um, I wonder if I could give you the chair, and if you could ask someone to move in second uh, item two under new business, and I'll just sit and watch. And then once that's been done, then you can give the chair back to me, and I'll take you to resolution number two, which deals with the balance of the land committee minutes. Resolution 2H in the land committee. So we're at CAO 07. LC04-2023, we're going to deal with the item that I've declared a pecuniary interest in, and Councillor McDermott, I'm going to hand the chair to you for that. Just the one item, and, and you'd need a mover and a seconder. Thank you. Just some explanation in regards to um, that we don't need the driveway because of the configuration of the parking spaces and ca cars can back up and exit to Ridge Road <coughs> North. Are, so is there is there any ability to, 
turn the car around there. We're backing into Ridge Road North. Who am I going for? I have the answer to this one, Mr. Hobbit? Yeah, so uh, you, Mr. Chair, to the Council, it, their parking spaces are at 90 degrees, so yes, they would back into the aisle and then turn and face Ridge Road North. They would uh, enter the street facing the street, facing the traffic. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that they weren't, we weren't expecting them to back up into Ridge Road. Thank you. No. Any other questions? All in favor? Carrie. Back to you, your work. Thank, thank you very much. You had a question? Yeah, and I have a question. We're still under other matters, part five, correct? If I wanted to bring something up at this point. We are about to embark upon the balance of the land committee minutes. Okay. And Council McDermott has the resolution for that. So, Council McDermott, your resolution would be with respect to the land committee minutes, with the exception of item two under new business, which we've already dealt with. Yes, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Christensen. That's CAO 7LCO 4 2023 land matters, March 16th, 2023 land committee minutes. The Council receives March 16th, 2023 land committee minutes. Uh, with the exception of item two as appendix one to report, uh, number CAO 06 LC 03 2023, and further the council approves the recommendations contained in appendix two. Councillor Lewis. Thank you, Your Worship. And just wanted to bring up one, one issue. I know the previous council made a decision to move in a certain direction with respect to short term rentals. And I understand that there's been some delays. Okay. So that's not on that's not on this agenda. No, but I wanted to bring it up under other matters. Yeah. Oh, okay. So we're we're not at new business. Yeah, we're not at new business or inquiries yet. Okay. So I'm ahead of myself. You're, you're ahead. Okay. You got a preview. Yeah. Yeah. Did I see your hand go up? I was waiting. Yeah. I yeah. Okay. You're next. Councilor Flag. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I'm just. Uh, I thought I had a moment after Councillor Lewis there, so um, I'm looking for the Hiawatha land number three. Thank you. Um, well, you can do it then if you want. So, <laughs> um, just looking for a little bit of background and whether um, the presentation that we had earlier today was um, was the proposal that. Uh, the land trans or the land committee would have received, and whether this was um, uh, an answer to that, um, or whether this was um, not presented to them at the time. Um, Mr. Hurlovich, maybe you can relate what was in the report that um, that's part of our agenda and was before the land committee, and what uh, the land committee's decision was based on. Yes, thank you, Worship. Uh, to you too. The uh, councillor. So the town has a policy that uh, provides that the town lands can merge with um, privately held lands if it's going to provide the minimum lot area set out in the zoning. Uh, in this case, it does not. Um, so the um, so because it doesn't comply with the policy, the recommendation was that the lands not be conveyed. Um, but, you know, as I saw from the speaker, it appears that he has concurrence from the region that it could support the septic system, the primary septic system, and a backup system uh, should that become necessary in the future. Uh, so that would be up to council as to whether or not they wish to waive their policy. Councillor Flagg? Um, thank you, uh, Your Worship. I think um, maybe I'd like to remove this, if I could, from um, and uh, deal with it separately, if that's possible. Yep, you can deal with it right now separately. So, did you? Is there anything further that you wanted to comment on? I'm a little green here, so uh, no. I think I'll leave it and uh, let someone with a little more experience uh, make those recommendations. Just seems like we should remove it. That's all. Yep. Okay. Councillor Noise. 
I'm just wondering, uh, the Appendix 1.3 addresses that about the septic system, um, that it's at the end of the, it's at the, end of the um, land committee minutes. And it really does go into a lot of detail in regards to the need for the septic, the, the, the problem with the septic system and the not enough acreage and things like that. However, it does say um, we require a septic system approval from the region, regional municipality of Niagara. I don't know which comes first, the chicken or the egg. I don't want to approve this and then find out that he still can't put a house on it. I guess maybe that's that's his risk. But I'm not sure if the region would approve this size because it's um, a very small parcel. And it, it looks like that the town staff did consider that. So, yeah, Councilor Noyes, what I... What I Think you might want to do if you're if you're concerned and you want to get some further information about this, um, you could ask for the report to be deferred to next uh, regular council meeting, which is April the something or other. April the yeah. is it April the twenty fourth? Yeah. So you could move to defer this to April the twenty fourth to allow Mr. Abraham to get something from or or staff to further consult the region to see whether it is possible. That, that's one of two um, impediments. The one yeah. is the size of the parcel, and the other one is the fact that there's no house on the uh, existing parcel owned by Mr. Abraham. Yeah, yeah and there's no, the frontage is also an issue. But I, I agree with you. I was going to go there saying if, if I was wondering if the staff had approached the region already to discuss this and had already had an answer or not. If they hadn't, then I would move to defer this until the next council meeting. Hopefully they will have an answer from the region at okay. that point. Councillor Dubinow, you're prepared to second that? Okay, so there's a motion to defer that item to April the 24th, regular council meeting. All those in favor? None opposed, that is carried. Um, okay, so now to the balance of the land committee minutes. Uh, any further questions or comments? If not, I'll call the question. All those in favor of the balance of the minutes? That is carried. That then takes us to uh, Councillor McDermott. You have a resolution regarding terms of reference uh, regarding council committees. Uh, thank you, Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Christensen, that council approves the terms of reference for the Accessibility Advisory Committee. And further, that council approves the terms of reference for the Committee of Adjustment. And further, that council approves the terms of reference for the Mayor's Youth Advisory Committee. And further, that council approves the terms of reference for the Museum and Cultural Heritage Advisory Committee. And further, council approves the terms of reference for the Property Standards Committee. And further, council approves the terms of reference for the Senior Citizens Advisory Committee. And further, the council directs staff to submit bylaws to council to repeal or amend necessary bylaws and adopt the new terms of reference. And further, the council directs that the Port Area Active Transportation Committee is dissolved and directs staff to submit a bylaw to council to repeal bylaws number 44-2010, 96-2013, and 128-2014. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Councillor Noyes. Um, thank you, Mayor Edekoff. Just in regards to the senior citizen um, composition there, and that would be on page four of five and three of five. And I'm just looking at the, the chart and I understand the staff contacted all, all the groups and asked them for feedback. It sounds like some of them didn't have feedback. But one of them that did have feedback was branch 230 supportive of amending the composition to an at-large, but yet we still have them as having one representative. And the other one I'm thinking of is that the 40 year Native Friendship Center seniors, they didn't, right now, there is a position for one. I think they do have a representative on it, don't they? Yeah, they have one. And that's no longer going to be part of that. And I'm just wanting to make sure that they're comfortable with that. I think what the, um, so immediately above the chart that you've made reference to in the listing of how the 17 applications would fill out, that's notional if we kept um, a, a situation where we required certain 
representation from certain groups, this is how this would work out. Um, but, but the proposal is that they all be at large. Okay. I assume. That's yeah. not what I'm, that's, that's, okay, I see Ashley shaking her head. Okay, so then they're all okay with that, then I'm fine. Any other counselors? Um, I wonder if someone would be prepared to uh, defer to April the 24th, the Mayor's Youth Advisory Committee Terms of Reference. I don't, I know that there was some dialogue with respect to that. I don't think that they've completely come to grips with some of the stuff and some of it is is novel. I don't, I know they talked about committees, but I noticed a couple of suggested positions. So would anyone be prepared to move that that be deferred to April the 24th, regular council? Councillor Dubinow, seconder, Councillor Christensen. Um, so I'm gonna call the question on that, uh, those terms of reference being deferred so that the Mayor's Youth Advisory Committee can take another look at them. All those in favor? None opposed, that is carried. Sort of the balance of the report and the recommendations. Any further questions or comments? If, Councilor Christensen? Just, just to confirm, Your Worship, it's um, the uh, open, the, the uh, general membership of the uh, Seniors Committee is contained um, at the very end and, and the final appendix of the report. And it speaks to um, eight, up to 18 members and uh, one member of council. So they are not specific. Right. Okay. If there are no other comments, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? None opposed. That is carried. That then takes us to uh, new business and inquiries. Councillor Dubinow, you have the first resolution. Yes, I do, Your Worship. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Flagg that Council accepts a resignation of June Chip from the Museum and Cultural Heritage Advisory Committee and further that Council directs staff to proceed with filling the vacancies in accordance with the procedural bylaw. Any questions or comments? All those in favour? Uh, none opposed. That is carried. Councillor McDermott, you have the next resolution. Thank you, Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Christensen. The Council accepts the resignation of Stephen Passero from the Community Gaming and Development Corporation. And uh, further, Council directs staff to proceed with filling the vacancies in accordance with the procedural bylaw. Questions or comments? All those in favor? And opposed? That is carried. Councillor Christensen, you have the next resolution. Jennifer Priestley from the Ridgeway Business Improvement Area Board of Management and further the council directs staff to proceed with filling the vacancies in accordance with the procedural bylaw. Thank you. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? None opposed. That is carried. You're very enthusiastic there, Council McDermott. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta watch him. Um, so before we go into, um, before we deal with the motion to go into closed session, um, is there any other inquiries or items of new business? Councillor Lewis. Thank you, Your Worship, and you had a little bit of a preview because uh, <laughs> my page is stuck together and I should have been paying attention to my tablet. Um, just a couple of remarks. I know the previous council made the decision to move in a certain direction with respect to the uh, short-term rental um, process. And um, I, do, I do have some concerns about coming up to the start of yet another season and at the moment still no recommendations before council. I understand that there's been some delays and given the importance of this topic to many people in the community involved, I'd like to move the following motion, that staff prepare a memo for the April 3rd. Okay, so you're, so you're out of order again. You're under notices of motion. Cor correct. Sorry about that. I thought you had an inquiry. I didn't realize you had a motion. So when we come to notices of motion, you can give the notice of motion. Well, and actually, Your Worship, what I'm trying to do here, and maybe you can give some advice, sure. is to have staff come back with a report showing options on how to advance the short-term rental land use study for Council's consideration. My concern is with a notice of motion, we're going to be delaying it yet further, and we could have staff tonight be given direction to move forward with a memo to come back with what are the options in terms of how we can move forward. Okay, well that, that would be out of order. You'd have to get a motion to 
waive the rules to allow you to bring that forward tonight. But I would suggest a more, a more direct and possibly equally fruitful um, direction for you to take is to ask some questions about a when does staff expect to receive this report uh, to put before council and uh, is there anything that can be done to move that forward more quickly so you don't have to bring a motion you don't have to get a report you can ask those questions right now okay and thank you your worship for your clarity on that matter through you to um, the director of planning or the CAO um, could you provide some clarity in terms of when the report for the land use study would be coming back to council or if there is anything that can be done to advance that process so that council can deal with the matter of short-term rentals um, sooner than later? And again, I go back to my concern being um, the report was to come in March um, for council's deliberation. I know I made a commitment to it being reviewed and looked at within the first 100 days. Um, that is my commitment. We're now well past that. Um, so if, some, if the CAO or the uh, director could provide some clarity on that, that would be great. Yeah, I'm going to ask the CAO to do that other piece of free advice. Don't make a commitment on something that you have no control over. <laughs> Anyways, that's... Um, by the way, did something happen this week or is something about to happen this week that we need to be aware of? Not at all. Not at all. That's not what I understand. <laughs> what but, I'm, but I'm more interested in the oh, question. It was last week. It was. Okay. So before I turn this over to, um, I meant to announce this, and I wanted to commend you on reaching the fourth uh, decade of your, well, you've completed the fourth decade of your existence. You're now embarking on the fifth decade. And so it's nice to know that the two of you, you and Councillor Dubinow, are helping to bring down the average age of this body. Well, but I'm and, insur and insurance premiums, and, uh, <laughs> and 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 also explains my um, my lack of clarity on procedural bylaws and where to bring this up in the agenda. So that's just a matter that's just a matter of experience. You'll you'll get that. But congratulations and happy birthday. Thank you. Um, I wish I could. I wish I'd have thought of that. In fact, I did think about it on the weekend. I wish I would have thought of that while the whole audience was here. They should be alerted to your, <laughs> your, your to your age, your your um, uh, maturing and mellowing. Thank you, Your Worship. And now I'm looking for the answer to my question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've I've diverted you long enough, have I, uh, Mr. McQueen? Thank you, through the chair. So um, the question. Uh, with respect to the report being brought back, um, the councillor is correct that there was um, a great deal of interest and information that came in uh, in the process that's um, delayed the process of coming back. And we had originally planned to come back for an update in March. So I think your request to have a memo coming back to the April 3rd meeting uh, is manageable. We can have uh, a memo come back just to give an update on the status of the project and maybe some options for council to uh, consider in terms of next steps and how that uh, could move forward if that would uh, be sufficient to the request that you were uh, asking for. So j just before I go back to Councillor Lewis, um, my recollection uh, is that we have a number of meetings next month. Do we have a, are we having a council meeting on the 11th or is it just the uh, 3rd and the 17th, Madam Clerk? Your Worship, uh, staff are meeting tomorrow afternoon to determine whether or not we need a meeting on, a, on April the 11th. Okay, uh, so that's fine. So Mr. McQueen, could we not get information back by at least April the 17th if we don't have a meeting on the 11th? Could we not get a memo that you'd refer to rather than wait till the 24th? Sorry, through the chair. Um, I was suggesting that we have a memo to the April 3rd uh, okay. committee and council meeting um, just to provide an update, okay, um, and then what those options I might didn't be. Say the third, but that's fine. Councilor Lewis, perfect. I look forward to the April third memo. Okay. Anything further? Nothing. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Noise. Then you have. I'm sorry, Councilor Noise. New business. Yes, I wanted an update on the broadband program that's going through town. I, I know that we have had a lot of requests, and it's been a while since we have had an update on how that's going and. Mm, when we can uh, just um, the broadband. broadband internet you are 40 now <laughs> 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 
So um, earlier this month, I did receive something from Bell indicating that in terms of the work on the Niagara Parkway, uh, they are finalizing their archaeological work, which had been held up. Um, but the bottom line is it depended upon weather uh, and the completion of that work um, and them not having to go to a stage four um, archaeological assessment, which they don't think will be required, um, then uh, they're going to be communicating with residents along the parkway and they're hoping to move forward. I th thought I had... At that time, they were talking in terms of a month or so, but they're talking about having the work possibly completed by August, uh, up and in service along the parkway. Now, Mr. Uh, McQueen, I don't know if you've got anything further with respect to the balance of the town, which I think you're also asking about. Um, through the chair, yeah, the information that the mayor shared um, is the most updated information I have on that project along the parkway. Um, in terms of other internet, I know that there's been some provincial announcements about new funding opportunities. We haven't had a chance to take a look at that yet and how that may or may not apply to Fort Erie, but I think uh, certainly there's interest from our staff uh, to see some of those areas uh, looked at and improved and with some urban area boundary expansions and some other things happening in the town, I think it's a good time for us to look at leveraging or accessing some of the provincial funds if they're available to continue to uh, roll out high-speed internet to some of the more rural areas that have not the level of coverage that we'd like. Mr. McQueen, I wonder if we could get uh, at the next regular council meeting um, a memo just providing an update. I know Rogers had been talking about uh, installing fiber in the rural area of the municipality, as had Bell. Um, some of that hinged on grants that they would receive from the federal or provincial governments. So I'm wondering if we could get some information and circulate that to members of council. And that would be one of those things that um, a councillor has asked, uh, has made an inquiry. And we used to have the slips that would be read into uh, the meeting by the um, corresponding member of staff so that that also becomes a, a matter of record. So can, can we do that? Can you have something for us for the next council meeting with an update? Yeah, we'll, we'll get an update back for sure. Okay. Uh, Councillor Noyes, sorry yeah, to keep uh, cutting in on No, no, that's fine. And actually, I was going to talk about that the Ontario government, and I would imagine federal too, um, but particularly the Ontario government, have announced more funding. I think it's their, their goal, is their strategic plan is to have all rural areas internet provided everywhere um, to all that needed and, and stuff. So I want to make sure that we, um, number we understand the, what funding may be available and we, we try to make sure we get our fair share. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other items of new business uh, or inquiries before we go into closed session? Councillor Flagg. Thank you, Worship. And again, I'm not 100% sure that this is where this can go in, but we received um, um, some resolutions earlier with uh, individuals resigning from their positions and I know some of these individuals have committed a great deal of time and effort um, in the town and I just thought it would be appropriate to thank them and uh, to acknowledge that effort. My understanding is yes you can you've done that right now but my understanding is that the clerk also corresponds with the individuals and thanks them for their service. Okay any other inquiries or items of new business? Then Councillor Noyes you have a resolution that we move into closed session. Mayor Riddicott, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Flagg that the Council will now hold a closed session meeting at 7.54 a.m. to consider the following. Pursuant to Section 239 and Brackets 2 and Brackets B of the Municipal Act 2001, personal matters about identifiable individual, including municipal or local board employees. Regarding appointments to boards and committees, Accessibility Advisory Committee, Senior Citizens Advisory Committee, Mayor Youth Advisory Committee, Forty Republic Library Board, Community Gaming Development Corporation. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? That is carried, so we're off to closed session.
the resolution mm -hmm. that uh, brings us back from closed session. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Christensen that Council does now rise with report and reconvene from closed session at 8.23 p.m. with report. Any questions or comments? And Madam Clerk, I understand the report will be the appointment of individuals to these various committees. You want to do that right now? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. And I just want to start by acknowledging that I will screw up some of the names here, so my apologies to those listening. Um, the Council appoints the following applicants to the Accessibility Advisory Committee for the term ending November the 14th, 2026, or until their successors are appointed. Ashley Gervais, Lori Brandt, Joseph Kiss Kissman, Bev Ferris, Adam McLeod, uh, Jenica Gresenbright, um, Dennis J. Hernandez Galliano, Marilyn Abs, and further that Council appoints Councillor Noyes to the Accessibility Advisory Committee, that the appointments to the Community Development Gaming Corporation be postponed to the special meeting of April the 3rd, 2023, that Council appoints Linda Hodge to the Fort Erie Public Library Board for the term ending November the 14th, 2026, until her successor is appointed. The Council appoints the following applicants to the Mayor's Youth Advisory Committee for the term ending November the 14th, 2026, or until their successors are appointed. Nicholas Mate, um, Belisk Belaquis, Mohit, Moham, Mohid Faimi, Teslim Faimi, uh, Natalie Whale, Paige Gizmondi, and Tristan Jagello, and that Council appoints Christopher Rowe to the Museum and Cultural Heritage Committee Advisory Committee for the term ending November the 14th, 2026, or until their successors are appointed. The Council appoints the following applicants to the Senior C Citizens Advisory Committee for the term ending November the 14th, 2026, or until their successors are appointed. Deborah Farley, Ellie Hurst, Maria Scott, Rosalie Snyder, Jane, Jane Crookshank, Wayne Ostermeyer, uh, Lita Greenaway, Sandra Peach, Bill Doyle, Anna Annunziata, Peter Grantham, Rosalind Tarrant, Dykins, Muriel Beckett, Graham Ring Ringnall, Helen Ringnall, Barbara Hopkins, and Michelle Burse. Are there any questions or comments? Councillor Noyes? This be the time that I would be nominated for the access to council rep for the accessibility? Uh, that was, I believe, part of the motion. Okay. Yes. So you, okay. Yeah, I wasn't you, here. I stepped out for a minute, so I just wanted to make sure. Oh, yeah. You, th that's when you get appointed. When you step out, <laughs> you get appointed. Yeah. Did you want to know the other committees we've appointed you to? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wasn't away for that long. <laughs> uh, okay. If there are no other questions, uh, all those in favor of the resolution? None opposed. That is carried. That takes us then to uh, Councillor Noy's motion. Mayor Riddikop, move by myself and seconded by Councillor Flagg, whereas residents have raised concern regarding the lack of before and after school programs in some schools in Fort Erie, and whereas the before and after school programs provide necessary, safe, and reliable care for our children, allowing parents to work, knowing that their children will be cared for in a safe and reliable setting, and whereas the lack of before and after school program is a result of inadequate funding for the program, lack of staffing of registered early childhood educators, lack of transportation to and from the schools that offer the program, and now, therefore, it be resolved that the Government of Ontario take the necessary steps to increase funding for before and after school programs, including transportation costs, increase the number of RECE graduates through creating more educational opportunity spaces in the appropriate colleges, and provide incentives to individuals to enroll and obtain their RECE designation and further, that this resolution be circulated to Premier Doug Ford, Minister of Education, MP and MPPs in Niagara, and the District School Board of Niagara and Niagara Catholic District School Board. 
Thank you very much for bringing this forward, Councillor Noyes, and for providing us with um, some background information. Did you want to speak to this? Yes, I would. Um, it was one of the things that I know that in Stevensville there, there wasn't any. Um, I think in the prior years there was, and they were bused, I think, to Joseph Brandt or one of the other schools, but they then had a waiting list, and of course, um, Stevensville and um, St. Joe's, you know, they couldn't, and there wasn't enough body, like there weren't, weren't enough children to to provide the program. But the other thing is that there's just not enough ECEs. Um, with the change in the school program and the JKs and all the all the additional needs in the, like I think most kindergartens now are JKs have two, usually an early childhood educator along with the teacher and things like that. There's just not enough um, staff to provide it. And I did have a chance to talk to uh, uh, some people from the region and they're all for you know, doing whatever they they can, and I think it is a regional. Um, the, the the government does give the region the money to coordinate all this, and they take the registration, et cetera, et cetera, on this. And they're all, um, the, you know, they, they wish they could provide it for everyone, but uh, again, the the it's provided by a third party, um, and it's really hard to, to find staff staff because they're not they're, they're not employees of the school board. They're usually you know, different agencies that provide have early childhood educators. And it's hard because before and after school program, you come for a few hours in the morning, I think th four hours in the morning, and then you have to come again later in the afternoon. But you can't overlap. Like, you can't be in the school during the day, so to speak. And, and most of the schools in the area are already designated that they can, if they have the appropriate funding and the staff, that the, each school to have to have it has to be designated as a as a school that can, can carry this program. I know St. Joseph's is, I know Stevensville is, and I would imagine most of the schools in Fort Erie are designated that they can have this program if everything else falls in place. And I'm remembering, and we probably all remember the, the personal support workers and what the problem was with personal support workers. You just couldn't find them. And the government really saw the problem, identified the problem. They created um, much more opportunities for education for the personal support workers, and they also actually paid them to take the course, et cetera, et cetera. So we have many more PSWs now that provide help for our seniors in homes and home care, and and in the and, and I'm hoping that they'll kind of take the same approach um, for the before and after school program to encourage early childhood educators, um, so we have we, we have more people to provide the service. Thank you. Um, any other members of council? If not, then I'll call the question. All those in favor. And that is unanimous. Um, that takes us to notices of motion. Are there any notices of motion this evening? Councillor Duvenau. Yeah, Your Worship, I'd like to give notice of motion regarding um, uh, a motion I'll bring forward. It's going to be, uh, I believe, April 24th is our next council meeting regarding enhanced um, enforcement and penalties of uh, driveway newspaper delivery um, as well as alternate methods of newspaper delivery within Fort Erie. Thank you, Worship. And you said April the 24th. Do you? Any others? If not, then, uh, Councillor Dubonau, I trust you've been practicing your reading skills with respect to the um, bylaw package. Now, we've got items 45, sorry, 43, 49, and 50 that have to be dealt with separately. Okay. And are there any others that anyone wishes removed from the uh, bylaw package? If not, then please proceed. Yes, Your Worship. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Noyes that the bylaw package containing 37 2023 to dissolve the Cemetery Advisory Committee, Communities in Bloom Committee, and Transit Advisory Committee um, repeal bylaw numbers 143 2016, 33 2017, 1 2019, and 24 2020. Uh, 38 2023 to designate 546 Ridge Road North as being of architectural and historical value or interest. 39 2023 to authorize into ent or, sorry to authorize the entry into and execution of a letter of agreement with His Majesty the King in right of Ontario represented by the Ministry or the Minister of Transportation under the dedicated gas tax funds for public transportation program. 40-2023 to establish a designated heritage property grant program. 41-2023 to exempt a certain block in plan 
59M-506 from Part Lock Control, Royal Ridge Drive Block 1. That's in the Royal Ridge subdivision uh, for 2834127 Ontario Limited. 42-2023 to exempt a certain block in Plan 59M-506 from Part Lock Control. Royal Ridge Drive Block 6, that's for the same subdivision and numbered company as above. 44-2023 to amend zoning bylaw number 12990 as amended for 316 Ridgeway Road. That's for Kevin Ronald Reichel, who's the owner. 45-2023 to amend zoning bylaw number 12990 as amended for 0-19302 Courtright Street. That's for uh, David Zapone, the owner. I apologize if I mispronounced his name. Uh, 46-2023 to amend bylaw number 11-2023. That's a, a name change, Kennedy Lindstone to Kennedy de Gruer. 47-2023 to accept and declare public lands, or sorry, to accept and declare lands as public highway on the west side of Buffalo Road, 629 Buffalo Road, uh, Cornelius, or Cornelius Wokel. 48-2023 to enact an amendment to the official plan adopted by bylaw number 15006 for the town of Fort Erie planning area amendment number 69 214 windmill point road south Joseph Moore and Irene Moore owners 51-2023 to amend zoning bylaw number 12990 as amended 214 windmill point road south same owners 52-2023 to accept and declare lands as public highway on the west side of Ridge Road North, 811 Ridge Road North, 5047104 Ontario Inc. and 2732440 Ontario Inc. 53-2023 to amend the Town of Fort Erie Investment Policy Bylaw number 109-2015 to increase portfolio limit of Schedule 1 banks is given first and second reading, Your Worship. Thank you. All those in favour? That is uh, carried and the bylaw package as amended is on the floor for questions or comments. Councillor Noyes. Thank you, Mayor Redekoff. Um, 40-2023 to establish a designated heritage property grant program. Um, I, I know that we discussed this before and it did come up in regards to that perhaps it should be a forgivable loan. I didn't see any mention, any pros and cons one way or the other. It seems to be absent from the report and I know that we had a fairly long discussion about that and we were supposed to get some more information on on that and i don't see it in the report i don't see any changes really in the report uh mr mcqueen do you want to respond to that uh through the chair i may defer that to mr herlovich, herlovich? sure uh, for a comment yep mr herlovich yeah uh, to you your worship to the counselor I'm not sure that i quite understood what it was that you felt was missing so the uh, during when this report was before us, Councillor Noyes raised the prospect of it being a loan as opposed to a grant, a forgivable loan as opposed to a grant. I think it was a forgivable loan over a period of time, as opposed to a grant. And her comment was, her question was that it's nothing in the bylaw, and um, she was expecting to get some type of information on that alternative prior to now. Right. So I recall that now. Um, However, the council of the day asked the staff to prepare a loan program, or a grant program, rather. That's what they brought back to you. That's what was um, presented was a grant program. If you'd like staff to look into a loan program, we can do that too. Councilor Noyes? Um, well, I thought that was the gist of the, that the staff would get back in regards to I mean, it's still kind of like a grant loan. Like, it's like they still get the money, but it's just that they have to, it's a loan, it's a forgivable loan, which in turn is kind of like a grant, um, that the we site, were going to get some more information on that. Um, and again, I just basically, and and I, I understand that um, we we do this for the for, for our physician recruitment. We have $100,000, and they have to provide... Um, five years of service, and if they don't, I think it's prorated for the number of years they did do it. I'm just concerned that this is taxpayers' money. After 10 years, they can provide 50, you know, they can actually apply for $50,000 worth of, 
um, worth of dollars. And on top of that, they they don't even have to apply. I guess they do have to apply, but they get a subsidy for their taxes to a certain extent. I don't know what the ceiling is. Um, I, I know, yeah. I don't know what the ceiling is. I can't. Uh, I don't think it's a percentage. I think it's a. There's a ceiling of so much money every year, um, because they have a heritage home. So, and when we first did that, it was to, because we realized that to maintain a heritage home, would require some funds. So I'm just. I would just want this to be a forgivable loan, that after so many years, like you can make it whatever year, how many years you want. If you want to make it four years or five years or even three years, so that they don't take the money improve the, the, the value of their home, again, taxpayers' money, and then sell the home. I, I, I don't see it being a problem in regards to, you know, you know if they're going to fix it, wonderful, but they're going to benefit and it's going to improve the value. And it's also going to maintain the heritage value. I think it's a win-win situation. I just don't want someone to take advantage of the taxpayers' money and um, increase the value of their home by 50000 and then leave. Councillor Dubineau. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. I, I just want to uh, comment on, on Councillor Noy's, uh, the issue she raised. And, and fundamentally, I, I think she makes a, a good point, particularly with physician recruitment, because you could have the physician come to town, they could take uh, the what we offer them, and then just decide to, you know, theoretically pick up, leave, move somewhere else, and, you know, we, we don't get a benefit from that. I think the fundamental difference with the heritage property grant program is that the properties are going to remain within our community no matter who owns them so even if an individual took advantage of this program improved the you know the value of their home renovated it and then sold the property um the the property still remains in fort erie and it's still a heritage property and that designation doesn't transfer like the owner can't take that with them it stays on the property it's attached to title so normally i i would completely agree with where Councillor Noyes is going. Um, it's just with regard to the fact that these properties are, are still here, we're still improving our, our, um, our built heritage and, and giving incentives to residents to embrace our built heritage and protect it. I, I, I view it a, a little differently, so I'm, I'm comfortable having it be a grant knowing the properties will still be here versus a forgivable loan because they can't pick up the houses and take them somewhere else. So that's my feeling to that. I, I think it's a good point, though, and I, I think it's very important that we be fiscally responsible, think of taxpayers' money. It's just in this situation, I, I think there's a, a benefit to having a grant rather than a loan. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Anyone else? Dr. Noyes, did you want to chime back in? Yeah. Um, again, it's can taxpayers' money and there's many programs that the, that, the, that you can access um, through the province and actually even through the region that's based on forgivable loans. Um, you know, when, when you're low income and you need to make improvements to your home, you can borrow up, depending on, I think, your income and stuff like that, up to $30,000 to, to replace your windows or put a new roof on or whatever, but you have to stay in the home because you're improving the value of the home. It's basically to recoup the value of the home. Whether the whether the heritage features stay in town or not, that's not that's not the, the issue. The issue is we've used they've used taxpayers' money to improve the value of their home. Again, they they already get a tax incentive every year on top of that. So again, I I don't see the problem with being forgiven. They still get the money. It's just that if they're not, you know, if they decide to, to leave and they sell their house, then they have to pay back a prorated amount. I, I don't, I don't see the problem with that, and we still have the heritage features regardless, one way or the other. Anyone else? Then, uh, Councillor Noyes, you have the resolution for third and final reading of the bylaw package. Well, I think I'm going to put a, I'm going to ask for an amendment to that. You can ask for an amendment. Okay, that the that the grant program be a. Well, okay, so so let's just separate this. We'll do the balance of the package. So when you come to, you're going to do the resolution for third and final reading. This is bylaw 40. Bylaw 40. So just leave bylaw 40 out of third and final reading along with bylaws 43, 49, and 50. We'll deal with the rest of the package. Then you can put 40, uh, 33, 40, 2023 on for third and final reading. You can move your amendment at that point, um, and I'll, I'll speak to it as well. 
Okay, now that bylaw, I'll move by myself and seconded by uh, Councillor Christensen, that bylaw 37 2023, 38 2023, 39 2023, 41 2023, 42 2023, 44 2023, 45 2023, 46 2023, 47 2023, 48 2023, 51 2023, 52 2023, and 53 2023. Be given third and final reading and be signed by the mayor and the clerk under this corporate seal. Thank you. Any uh, questions or comments with respect to those bylaws that have been given third and final reading? Councillor Noyes? And I do apologize if I was going to bring this up earlier. I just want to make sure that 40, yeah, 45 is on here. 4523, the Cartwright Street home. That is, again, that's not the home that has the problem with the parking. That's another one? Okay, because I... This is a duplex. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor of third and final reading of the bylaws that were referred to? That would still remain in the package? Okay. So, Councillor Noyes, back to you. You can do third and final reading for 40 2023, which is the um, bylaw to establish a designated heritage property grant program. Yes, I'd like to amend that so that. Well, the... you have to put it on the floor okay. for third and final oh. reading first. Okay. For. Um... Move by myself and seconded by uh, Councilor Christensen that bylaw number 40, 2023 be given third and final reading to be signed by the mayor and the clerk under the corporate seal. Okay. So that's on the floor. Now you want to move an amendment? Yes. I, I'd like to amend that the grant portion be a forgivable loan um, over a three year period and be prorated. Your seconder, Councilor Lewis. Uh, questions or comments to that, Councillor Dubonneau? Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. I'm, I'm not going to support the amendment, but I, I want to make it clear that I, I agree with the intent of what Councillor Noyes is, is trying to accomplish. I, I think if the circumstances, if it was a different program, I, I would fully support um, it being a forgivable loan. But I'm, I'm just going to reiterate the, the point I, I made earlier, which is that these homes aren't being picked up and, and physically taken out of the community. And even though we may be improving the value of that individual's um, home, I think by um, encouraging um, our built heritage and protection of our built heritage, we're also improving the value of our community. So it's not just a benefit for these residents to be able to um, you know, maintain and repair the heritage aspects of their home. It also benefits the community. And when I look at it and I weigh that balance, I think a grant is more appropriate in this case. It makes it uh, more likely people will apply, more likely people will take advantage of it, knowing that there isn't some trap they could fall into and, and have that clawed back. Um, I think if we're going to get serious about uh, encouraging um, you know, heritage designations and protecting our built heritage, and I think that's critically important because of all the changes we're seeing in our community and the way that we remember where we came from as our community changes is to preserve these buildings and our heritage. Um, I think we should be doing everything we can. I know that no one is going to be picking. I, I know we have one house on Beechwood that we're in the process of designating. Someone physically picked up that house and moved it from one end of town to the other. But I don't think anyone's going to be picking up these homes and taking them out of Fort Erie after we give a grant. So in, in that case, just for the sake of encouraging individuals, making it easier and more open and friendly as part of the process, I would prefer to see this as a grant. So I... I I completely agree with Councillor where Councillor Noyes is, is going in the intent, but I think in this particular circumstance, a grant is more appropriate, so I won't be supporting the amendment, Your Worship. Anyone else to the amendment? Councillor Christensen. Uh, through you, Your Worship. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat ambivalent, and I, I think I agree with uh, Councillor Dubineau that um, the the intent is there, and I'm still ambivalent. The fact is that there are two different kinds of grants. This is the second. The first type of grant is where the money is given ahead of time, and then there are performance measures that are used to determine whether, in fact, the recipient uh, um, achieved the goals of the grant program. The second, which this is, is, in fact, a reimbursement. So the individual uh, is laying their own money out be beforehand, 
and then subject to approval by the town uh, through all of its processes, its inspections processes, uh, including the heritage component, is in fact, um, uh, then, then they would uh, get the reimbursement if appropriate. Uh, so, so that's where being the second, it, it uh, uh, gives me, yeah, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm ambivalent because uh, alone, um, you know, is it, are we discouraging flippers? Um, and I'm, I don't know to the, the extent to which purchasers of heritage homes are in the house flipping business. Because that effectively, I think that's what we're talking about, preventing some of that, um, that flipping uh, and, um, you know, re receiving, um, you know, inve inve effectively investing public monies and then making a profit on it in a short period of time. Um, I know it can happen. I don't know how uh, um, frequent that situation is, and I'd you know, love to be educated on it, but I just wanted to state that's, that's my perception of this. And uh, the, given the nature of the reimbursement program versus um, either a pure grant or a loan, I'm, I'm wondering whether we're, we're sort of going up the middle anyway. I just. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilor McDermott, would you like to take the chair? Let me speak to this, please. Your Worship. So this, um, the report that is the basis of this bylaw um, was brought forward um, as a result of a notice of motion. I brought forward the notice of motion uh, to request that there be a grant program. And there was, a, there was a reason for that. And the reason was that up until now, um, we had, up until recently, we have tried to work with people to agree to designate their properties. More recently, there have been some properties that have been uh, threatened, and we have, we have decided that we should take a more proactive approach to protecting our built heritage. Um, in order to do that, yes, there are, uh, there, there are some tax uh, benefits for people that have uh, designated properties. Um, but we're also expecting these people to uh, maintain their property. And uh, $10,000 uh, requires them to at least match that. Um, we have a CIP uh, program that um, provides money for individuals who want to upgrade the facade of their buildings in downtown areas. That's a grant. Uh, but they have to match the amount of money that uh, we are prepared to give them. The region uh, has up until now also, uh, up until recently, contributed as well. Um, the, the return on investment um, from the, the work that we had done in our downtown areas was something like 9, 10, 11, 12 to 1. So that for every dollar we would put in to the facade program, the property owner might put in 12. So that actually uh, improved our downtown areas, increased our assessment base, and helped beautify our downtown areas. That's a grant. Um, there was a policy reason for that. And the policy reason was that we wanted to help these property owners improve the look of their buildings, which had the corresponding benefit of helping to improve the whole downtown core area. We also have a grant program through a CIP with respect to the construction of uh, rental units in uh, units above commercial um, properties in our downtown cores. Again, it's a matching type of program, but it's a grant, <coughs> and the policy behind that is to try to get more rental units in the market for people. There's a policy, for, policy reason for this being a grant program, and that's because we want to entice people to want to participate in the program where we try to protect um, our heritage properties. And the other policy uh, foundation is that if we're going to start telling people you must designate this property because we're going to designate it, then we should be trying to at least provide them with some um, comfort in the fact that we value their property, we want them to value their property, and the proof that we value it is not only that we're designating it, but we're going to assist them to uh, maintain that property. It doesn't really matter who owns the property, from my perspective. If they fulfill the conditions of the program, 
and uh, they put up their own money um, to assist in the improvement um, or the um, renovation, not the renovation, but the uh, repair, fine. To me, that's what's important. It's the building. It's the history and the heritage that's attached to the building that's important, not who owns the property. Um, so I think it should be a grant program. That's why I moved that it should be a grant program. These are the reasons that I hope uh, maybe shift your ambivalence towards uh, full-throated support. Uh, so I, 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 I'm not going to support the amendment because I don't think it should be a, a loan program. Um, and my final comment um, with respect to this is the um, Heritage Committee sent out some letters recently with respect to uh, properties that are on the registry. Those are properties that um, could be designated. And as we all know, Bill 23 has put a lot of pressure on municipalities to move through their list of registered properties within, a, within two years, failing which they'll fall off the registry and they can't be put back on for five years. So the committee sent out 34 letters to people to see who is interested because they're trying to establish what their priorities might be. Of the 34 letters they sent out, two property owners expressed interest, three property owners wanted more information, five property owners would not like to designate, and that meant that 24 um, didn't respond. So they're going to have to go back out. We need, to, we need to encourage people to volunteer to have their properties designated Otherwise, we're going to have to, it's going to be a lot more difficult for us. So for the sake of $10,000 $10, a year, uh, a lot of hoops that people have to go through in order to qualify, um, I, I think it should be a grant. And I think anything that discourages people from wanting to designate their heritage property just creates more difficulties for us down the road at a time when the growth and development that's taking place in this community does put a lot of these properties under threat, not to mention Bill 23. So I hope that you'll... Um, I hope that this will be defeated and that we can move forward with the grant program. Sorry, Councillor Noyes, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I understand what you're, what you're saying, what your position on this is. I tend to agree with Councillor um, Dubinow that in some situations the, the forgivable loan is appropriate. In this particular situation, though, I think the grant is appropriate. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Noyes. Thank you, and, and I can appreciate the, the other side of the, the equation. I really can. Um, uh, but as the mayor had outlined, that uh, that there's 34 letters were sent out and 22 didn't respond. Um, and, and thinking that if you give them money, they're going to you know say, okay, fine, let's do it. They may or they may not. To me, a forgivable loan is basically like a grant. We're just having some expectation that if they increase the value of their home, which they should if they're putting the money into it, that um, they're going to get it out of the, you know, they, they stay around for a bit. Um, the other thing, too, I'm not talking about flippers. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about someone with the best intentions um, in a few, you know, over, over five years, take advantage of the thing, puts $50,000 worth of taxpayers' money, plus they're getting the, subsidy, the tax subsidy, um, gets a job relocation. And, and has to has to leave or wins a wins the lottery and wants to move to Hawaii, whichever. Um, I'm not thinking that anybody would be doing it for any nefarious reason to flip it or whatever. Um, I didn't think about that one. Um, I'm just thinking about again protecting the taxpayers' money and the the fifty thousand um, over 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 you know ten years. It's fifty thousand dollars. It's a lot of money, and it's taxpayers' money. And I just think there should be some expectation that they get it now and it, it doesn't matter if it's a grant or if it's a loan they still would have to follow the same expectations type thing in regard to they get the money once they show the invoices and the project gets completed and it's approved by by the powers to be so i'm not going to keep beating a dead horse here but again i think it's taxpayers money that was where my concern is council Lewis. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and um, and Council for um, for the discussion. I seconded the motion for the purpose of bringing it up and having um, a discussion on the matter. Um, regardless of where this goes, I'm glad we're moving in the direction we're moving in, for all of the reasons that were given, both those in favor of Councillor Noyes's um, amendment and those um, not in favor of those. So those are my only comments on that. 
Okay, so if there's nothing further, I'll call the question on the uh, amendment. Uh, on the amendment. All in favor? Opposed, if any? So the motion is defeated. Uh, so now we'll vote on 38-2023. Um, uh, it's 40, actually. Is it 40? Yeah. I'm sorry. 40-2023. Any comments or questions? All in favor? Opposed, if any? Gary, back to you, Your Worship. Thank you very much, um, Councilor McDermott. And Councilor Noyes, you have... Um, no, we go to first and second reading, Councilor Dubinow, for 40, uh, 3, 49, and 50. Yes, Your Worship. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councilor Noyes that the bylaw package containing 43-2023 to amend zoning bylaw number 12990 as amended, 0-17100, 0-17101, and 0-101. 02 Schooley Road uh, by um, owned by 22 or sorry 2277587 Ontario Inc. Phil Smith and Mars Homes Crystal Beach Incorporated uh, Dan Gabriel owners 49-2023 to repeal deeming bylaw number 131-2000 for 110 Rebstock Road, Mars Homes, Rebstock Incorporated owner, and 50-2023 to exempt certain lots in plan 59M65 from part lot control lots 36, 37, 52, and 53, Rebstock Road and Loganberry Court, Jetmar Subdivision, Mars Homes, Rebstock Incorporated is given first and second reading. All those in favor? And opposed, that is carried. That uh, Those bylaws are on the floor for any questions or comments. Councillor Dubineau. I just want to make one quick comment. I love the name Logan Berry Court. Thank you, Your Worship. <laughs> that was actually something we came up with on the, the wayfinding committee during the last term. I, I think it's a great name, Your Worship. Thank you. So if... If you're not at home and your wife is looking for you, we should be looking for you on Loganberry Lane. <laughs> okay, good heads up. Uh, Councillor Noyes, third and final reading, please, for those um, three bylaws. Yeah, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Christensen that bylaw number 43, 2023, bylaw number 49, 2023, and bylaw number 50, 2023 are given third and final reading to be signed by the mayor and the clerk under the corporate seal. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? None opposed, that is carried. That then takes us to Councillor Flagg, and you have the first and second reading for the confirmatory bylaw. I do move by myself, second by Councillor McDermott, the bylaw 54 2023 to confirm the actions of Council at its special Council and Committee meeting held on March 6, 2023, Council and Committee meeting held on March 20th, 2023, and its Council meeting held on March 27th, 2023, is given first and second reading. All those in favor? And opposed, that is carried. Councillor Lewis, third and final reading. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Christensen that bylaw number 54, 2023, is given third and final reading, be signed by the Mayor and the Clerk and the Corporate Seal. Uh, any questions or comments? All those in favor? That is unanimous. Um, so that takes us to scheduling of meetings. Any meetings that anyone wishes to alert us to? Councillor Noyes. Yes, tomorrow the Accessibility Committee meeting uh, occurs in Conference Room 1 at 4 p.m. And then on Wednesday, the 29th, the Infrastructure Business Subcommittee meeting in Conference Room 1 at 3 p.m. And I guess we all know about our strategic planning meeting that's coming up on Friday. Is that at, uh, is that at 1 o'clock? Uh, yeah, okay, 1 o'clock Friday, which is the 31st. Any other meetings? Councillor Christensen. Um, <clears throat> On uh, Wednesday, April 5th, the um, uh, Seniors Advisory Committee will be meeting. Did you say April 5th? Yes, Your Worship, at 10 a.m. 
And uh, Councillor Lewis, did you have your hand up? No. Okay. Okay. So we have. Um, I have corporate and community services on Thursday. Is that correct? And that's at four. And any other meetings? No. Then uh, over to you, Councilor Dubino. Yes, and this one's much shorter, Your Worship. <laughs> Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Flagg that Council adjourns at 9.03 p.m. to reconvene into a regular meeting of Council on April 24th, 2023. All those in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you all.